I would first like to thank the Human Relations uh, Commission for providing the translation this evening. Thank you very much. The Ad Hoc Committee on Gang Violence and Youth Development will now come to order. We have a special guest with us this evening, so I will begin with a statement and then I will give an opportunity for my colleagues, Councilmember Hahn, Reyes, to say a few words and then also for our guest, the Congressman Bobby Scott as well, to say a few words before we open up our first item. Good evening and welcome to the John Ferraro City Council Chambers for a special ad hoc committee meeting on gang violence and youth development. Today is Thursday, February 19th, at approximately 5.24 p.m. The committee is airing live on Channel 35. In addition, the committee hearing is available via webcast at www.lacity.org or via city council phone at, by dialing 213-621-CITY. The agenda is also available online at www.lacity.org. For those of you not familiar with the committee process, the meeting is open to the public and public comment cards are available in the back for those who wish to comment on specific items. Before I begin, <clears throat> I would like to personally thank United States Congressman Robert Bobby Scott for working with me in the City of Los Angeles and agreeing to join us in this critical meeting to discuss the, discuss the federal bill, the Youth Promise Act. I would also like to thank the over 55 different agencies, gang intervention agencies, universities and governmental entities that are sponsoring this historic meeting and agreeing to educate their constituents on the need for a new way of approaching the issue of juvenile delinquency. Before we begin the hearing, it's important that I give a national, statewide and local context about why we're having today's hearing. For the first time in the history of the United States, more than one in every hundred adults is locked up in jail or in prison. More than 2.3 million people are behind bars. One in five people in the U.S. has a criminal record. When you look at California, the statistics are just as staggering. California leads the entire world in incarceration on a per pupil basis with more than 175,000 people in our state in prisons and or in jails. We spend roughly approximately 46 thousand dollars a year for one adult in prison per annum and two hundred fifty two thousand dollars a year to incarcerate one youth compare that to some of the programs that are only twelve to thirteen hundred dollars in it it costs a year to keep that same youth or adult in an intervention or prevention program california spends over ten billion dollars in incarceration costs from the state's general fund the state's general fund only allots $7.1 billion of its funding to the UC college system and California State University system combined. In terms of Los Angeles, Los Angeles is the gang capital of the world. It's nothing for us to be proud of. With an estimated 700 gangs and an estimated 40,000 gang members in the city of Los Angeles, and allegedly over 1,000 gangs and over 80,000 gang members throughout the county of Los Angeles. The violence is at, a, is at such an epidemic level that almost 75% of all youth gang homicides in the state of California happen in the county of Los Angeles. However, in terms of resources, we as a country and as a city do not adequately fund critical prevention or intervention services. The recent stimulus package provides $3.5 billion to support law enforcement efforts, including $1 billion for the COPS program and almost no money for community-based youth development programs. Again, throwing more money to suppression and not investing in long-term front-end uh, youth development is leaving out a big part of the solution. Youth violence happens because we as a society have not addressed the root causes and conditions such as poverty, homelessness, lack of jobs, inadequate educational and health systems, and many other issues that we are not providing funding for. And therefore, violence is flourishing. As a California State Assemblyman, I'm very proud to say that I co-authored and passed AB 1913, the Shift Cardenas Crime Prevention Act, which has provided counties with approximately $100 million per year the single largest appropriation of state funds for youth crime and violence prevention and intervention in California history. And I also must point out that it, since that bill was passed, 
It's approximately $100 million a year stagnant that is provided out of the state general fund for prevention and intervention programs. Yet our incarceration system was being given $5 billion eight years ago, $5 billion a year. Today it's $10 billion that has been budgeted for the state's incarceration system. So while juvenile justice funding remains stagnant, we are spending more and more do dollars in the billions for other parts of our system. I'm committed to working with the national leaders such as Bobby Scott to ensure that we write effective legislation that will significantly reform the juvenile justice system for our nation and for our local communities like Los Angeles. At this time, I'd like to turn the microphone over to my colleague Janice Hahn to say a few words, and then Ed Reyes, and then we'll invite the congressman as well. Thank you very much. Uh, my dear colleague, Tony Cardenas, who's been my partner uh, for the last few years as we have tried to redirect the focus in the city of Los Angeles uh, in terms of ending gang violence in Los Angeles. And I really want to welcome Congressmember Bobby Scott uh, here to our Los Angeles City Council Chambers. This is where we meet uh, three times uh, a week. And I'm really proud of you, Congressmember, for your uh, Youth Promise Act because that really, uh, I believe, uh, will be so critical in, in our efforts here to end gang violence. We had a local measure on our ballot last November, uh, and it was Proposition A. And it would have raised $30 million a year uh, to fund after-school programs, job training programs, mentoring, tutoring, intervention programs, because we had come to the realization here in Los Angeles that uh, we've been fighting the war on gangs in Los Angeles for over 20 years. We've arrested about 400,000 people in relationship to gang violence. And yet today, we had uh, six times the number of gangs and twice the number of gang members uh, who were in Los Angeles. So clearly what we were doing did not work. Our own chief of police, uh, Bill Bratton, said we can't arrest our way out of this. Uh, so Measure A would have uh, helped to fund that. It needed 66.6. 66% of the vote to pass, and it received 66.28. Uh, it came so close to winning, but it was an affirmation, I think, for us that clearly the overwhelming majority of Angelinos agreed that the only way we were going to end gang violence is if we agreed to spend more money on the front end of kids' lives, investing in giving them uh, reasons not to join a gang. So we really welcome you here and look forward to uh, partnering with you on your legislation. Thank you. Councilmember Reyes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilman Cardenas, uh, Councilman Hahn, for your consistency and your dedication in addressing this very critical issue in our current times. I want to thank uh, Congressman Bobby Scott for allowing the citizenry, the folks in our cities, to look at this issue from a different perspective. It's very easy to carry the stick. It's very easy to oppress. But it's not as easy to look at the human factor, the social impacts, and the educational needs of our youth that could change their future, their options, or the decision-making. You know, in this city, if we had one computer program technology that could monitor all the contracts, I know that technology exists, we could actually monitor all the contracts the city generates in such a way where we could identify dollars for real jobs for our youth. This city of Los Angeles generates about a billion dollars in contracts, close to 10,000 jobs that are lost that are lost to the young people of this city. Now, changing this attitude, changing this priority, stimulating a political will to create an environment where we can actually create jobs, I believe is a good part of the solution. If our young people had a job, they had a sense of purpose and how their careers can begin and initiate the type of vision that sees them participating society in a manner that is constructive, that's the type of opportunity we can create. So I'm hoping through this committee, 
working with the mayor's office, that we get to that point, because for four years, I've been trying to establish a sense of priority by asking each director of each department, where are the jobs going and why aren't they staying in Los Angeles? Who is accountable for that discussion? And that is a process that we need to reach a final conclusion in that process so we can create these jobs. So I thank you for your presence. We need to amplify that message. We all know that, as Father Gregory Boyle has said many a time, nothing stops a bullet better than a job. So I thank you for this opportunity, and I'm looking forward to seeing these very constructive changes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Congressman, any opening remarks? Well, thank you very much, uh, Councilman, and it's a pleasure to join you and Councilwoman Hahn and Councilman Reyes. Uh, and I certainly appreciate your hospitality today. We had many visits to facilities all over the city of Los Angeles. And more tomorrow. And more tomorrow. Uh, and I'm learning a lot about uh, Los Angeles, uh, but the problems here aren't significantly different than they are everywhere else. Uh, we have to start taking a new approach to reduce gang violence before young people join gangs. Uh, Council, uh, Councilwoman uh, Hahn has indicated that on a referendum, almost two-thirds agree with that position, so we have to get just a few more votes uh, next time. And I think the uh, tide has turned. The idea that you can try to lock your way up out of, the, um, out of this problem uh, it really does not address the crime rate uh, because if you don't change the trajectory that young people are, are on, whatever you do to this week's criminal will be replaced by next week's criminal because they're on the same trajectory. Uh, so I appreciate your hard work in this and look forward to working with you and look forward to item number two on the agenda. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you. And, and uh, once again, we want to thank you for your leadership. And unfortunately, from my perspective, your uniqueness uh, in Washington. I met many U.S. Senators and Congressional members, and you're the first person who speaks uh, with evidence-based uh, uh, understanding about uh, what we need to do as a country and, and what we need to do locally. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Councilwoman Hahn uh, to open up on item number one. Okay, Madam Clerk, item one. Item number one is discussion on the documentary movie Crips and Bloods, Made in America. Councilmember Cardenas, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Councilmember Hahn. We're going to do this uh, full council style. <laughs> Um, today, we have a resolution in support of the filmmakers of the award-winning documentary Crips and Bloods Made in America. Today, we're here to honor the filmmakers of the award-winning documentary, including director Stacy Peralta and producers Cash Warren and Baron Davis. The documentary tells the story of the Crips and Bloods, South Los Angeles' two most infamous African-American gangs. Although the documentary chronicles a decades-long conflict, the film produces and an avenue for ex-gang members, gang intervention experts, writers, activists, academics uh, to provide solutions to the problem of gang violence. And it also gives a great perspective and opportunity in honoring the victims of this violence as well, especially the women who have a strong voice and certainly feel the pain as much if not more than most of us when they lose their children. Therefore, along with my colleagues on the City Council, the Mayor, City Attorney, and the City Controller, we acknowledge Crips and Bloods Made in America for fundamentally challenging Los Angeles and the rest of the country to reconsider the way that America addresses gang violence and that America needs to begin providing the infrastructure and resources needed to truly achieve long-lasting peace and safety in our communities. Um, which order would you like? Okay. They're shy. Oh, come on, Stacey. You're first. Uh, what, what, what would you like to uh, Let's talk a little bit about why you did the film. <clears throat> I'm a Los Angeles resident, born and raised. I uh, went to Venice High School. There was gang violence at my high school. The day we began production on this film, a kid was shot at my former high school. I can't understand why America could defeat Japan and Nazi Germany 
in World War II, but yet we can't defeat gang violence. And the sad thing is, is so many young Americans are dying from this every year, and it's four decades long now. And I finally asked myself this one question before I made the film, which was, if affluent white kids in Brentwood were forming gangs and arming themselves with automatic assault rifles, and they were killing affluent white teenagers in Beverly Hills who were also doing the same, what would be the response of our government? And it seems to me that we would, our government would come in and stop it immediately. But somehow, with these kids growing up in the inner cities, the Latino kids and the African Americans, it seems that there's a different value placed on them. And so what we do is we try to oppress our way out of this, but we don't solve it. And it will never be solved. I'm pro-law enforcement, but we will never solve this through law enforcement because it's not a law enforcement issue. It's a societal issue. So that was my reasoning for wanting to make the film. And thank God I met Baron Davis, who put up his own money because Hollywood did not want to finance the film. I'd like to thank everybody. Uh, you know, I, we made this film basically because, you know, I wanted kids to understand and see that, you know, I am also a product of my environment. And growing up in South Central Los Angeles, having, you know, various family members, uh, friends, you know, in gangs, um, you know, coming home one day, seeing someone killed, the next day seeing someone locked up, uh, you know, it, it inspired me to make it. And the fact that I had opportunities and I had resources you know, uh, in my life allowed me to keep striving to do better. And once I had an opportunity to make it to the NBA, I always wanted to give back to the community. And I know for athletes, a lot of athletes, uh, you know, that's one of the hardest things to do is how do you give back? You know, uh, what is the, the most important way or, you know, who do you give the money to? And every time you run up on uh, the point of gangs, you know, in order to get to the kids, you got to deal with the gang members. So for me, you know, knowing all the gang members, I wanted to give them an opportunity to speak, you know, to the public and, and share their point of view. And uh, connecting with Stacy really sh shone light uh, on that situation. And with this film, ultimately, like my goal was to inspire guys in my neighborhood, guys who are in gangs to get out, or guys who are in other neighborhoods to realize that we're all human beings, that we all share the same thing. We wake up in the morning, we go to sleep at night, and to realize that we're all human. And the most important thing in this community and the most important thing in Los Angeles are the kids. And if these kids can, if the gang members can, can form peace and if these kids can see that, then we can ultimately get bills passed to where we can have programming and give kids the same opportunities that I had and we can have more kids that are positive and uh, impact on the environment. So thank you all for having me, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm one of the producers on the film, and uh, Barron's been my best friend since we were 12 years old. And I, I was m fortunate to grow up in Brentwood and Westwood, and so from an early age, we were able to kind of see the juxtaposition of uh, the value on human life, uh, even in our own city. And we set out to make, I mean, I, I was kind of just connecting dots here. These are the, the real talent behind it. But from my perspective, film has always been the strongest medium to communicate with the most people. And Baron and Stacey sought out to enact real change, and we wanted to make a film that could help, uh, help fulfill that. And so with this film, uh, we, we want this to be the first step of uh, hopefully enacting some real systemic change and uh, moving forward. But thanks for your time today. I think, I think this is a perfect opportunity for one of you to tell us where is the film uh, uh, being shown right now? What, do you have any semblance of the schedule and, and how's it going and, and how can people come and see the film? Absolutely. Uh, so as we shed light on earlier today, this wasn't something that Hollywood from a big industry perspective really wanted to, to support and um, so we've had to do it on our own and we're fortunate enough to uh, be showing it right now at the Sunset Lemley Theater. It's moving to the Santa Monica Lemley, and then from there we're doing city rollouts. Um, if you uh, have interest in supporting the film and getting behind some of the causes that we're supporting, you can check out the website. It's CripsAndBloodsMovie.com, 
and you'll be able to see a full schedule of where the film is being released in the immediate future and then also a place to, to buy the DVD. We're fortunate that PBS did step up to the plate and through their ITVS series we're going to be one of their tentpole releases this year and so it will be airing on PBS uh, coming soon and from there the DVD will go wide and release so you'll be able to get it at your... We were shortlisted for the Academy Awards. We uh, made it into the Sundance Film Festival. We've uh, been, we've been uh, actually received a, a lot of accolades for it. We've been fortunate. Academy Award winner Forrest Whitaker narrated it for us, uh, and Stacy directed it, and Barron produced it. So we've been fortunate to have some big names behind the film, and it's, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be on all of us, though, to push it forward and make sure everyone has a chance to see it. So with that, by the power vested in me, the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> <laughs> On behalf of the City of Los Angeles, all of the elected officials that represent us at the citywide level and every member of the City Council, we wholeheartedly want to give to you this resolution uh, for your efforts and your uniqueness and for your willingness to show these families and these kids when you're not welcome or not accepted. Hollywood told you, Stacy Peralta, hey, do a film and we're all behind you. And then when you told them you wanted to do this film, they weren't there, but you did it anyway. So I just want to congratulate you and thank you for prevailing and persisting and providing us with, a, with such a tremendous, tremendous piece of work. And I know that this is going to be the beginning of many wonderful, life-changing pieces of work that you're going to do for the community. Congratulations and God bless you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Hunt. Thank you. You're welcome. Are you coming back up here to take the chair back? Oh, item two, Madam Clerk. Item number two is the Chief Legislative Analyst reports in response to Resolution Smith for Parks Cardenas relative to the city's position on the youth prison reduction through opportunities, mentoring, intervention, support, and education act, the Youth Promised Act. This item was also referred to Rules and Government Committee. Thank you very much. Uh, it's not very often that we actually have the author of um, legislation that it's introduced in Congress, but today we do. So with that, I'd like to give the opportunity to Congressman Robert Bobby Scott, the author of this legislation, uh, to make a presentation and explain to us what is the Youth Promise Act. Congressman? Well, thank you, uh, Councilman Cardenas. It's certainly a pleasure to be here to talk about the Youth Promise Act and I'd frankly like to start with a poem that puts it in perspective. Um, the poem is entitled, a, a Fence or an Ambulance. It was written in 1895. The poem goes as follows. "'Twas a dangerous cliff, as they freely confessed, though to walk near its crest was so pleasant, but over its terrible edge there had slipped a duke and full many a peasant. So people said that something would have to be done, but their projects did not at all dally. Some said put a fence round the edge of a cliff. Some said an ambulance down in the valley. But the cry for the ambulance carried the day, for it spread through the neighboring city. A fence may be useful or not, it is true, but each heart became a foot, became a full, became full of pity for those who had slipped over the dangerous cliff, and the dwellers in highway and alley gave pounds and gave pence, not to put up a fence, but an ambulance down in the valley. For the cliff is all right if you're careful, they said, and if folks even slip and are dropping, it isn't the slipping that hurts them so much as the shock down below when they're stopping. So day after day as these mishaps occurred, quick forth with these rescuers sally, to pick up the victims who fell off the cliff with their ambulance down in the valley. Then an old sage remarked, "'Tis a marvel to me that people give far more attention to repairing the results than stopping the cause when they'd much better aim at prevention. Let us stop at its source all this mischief," cried he. "'Come, neighbors and friends, let us rally. If the fence we will fence, we may almost dispense with the ambulance down in the valley." Oh, he's a fanatic. The others rejoined, dispense with an ambulance? Never. He'd dispense with all charities, too, if he could. No, no, we'll support them forever. Aren't we picking up folks just as fast as they fall? Shall this man dictate to us, shall he? 
Why should people have since stopped to put up a fence while the ambulance works in the valley? But a sensible few who are practical, too, will not bear with such nonsense much longer. They believe that prevention is better than cure, and their party will soon be the stronger. Encourage them then with your purse, voice, and pen, while other philanthropists dally. They will scorn all pretense and put up a stout fence over the cliff that hangs over the valley. Better guide well the young than reclaim them when old, for the voice of true wisdom is calling. To rescue the falling is good, but tis best to prevent other people from falling. Better close up the source of temptation and crime than deliver from dungeon or galley. Better put up a strong fence round the top of a cliff than an ambulance down in the valley. Uh, I think that um, pretty much sums up the debate as to what we ought to be doing. The Youth Promise Act is a proactive, collaborative approach to youth violence. It requires, um, it requires a neighborhood or an area or a city to get people around the table, everybody that has something to do with youth violence. That would be obviously law enforcement. It would be the school system. It would be foster care. Everybody, mental health, everybody that has anything to do with youth violence, get them around the table and ascertain what the problem is and what solutions based on research they can enact to reduce juvenile crime. It, it also has a provision for uh, significant research and another provision to um, encourage and train uh, police officers on how to effectively deal with youth violence. But it takes a, because it has a uh, evidence-based approach we know that most of the money will be invested in prevention and early intervention and after the fact rehabilitation because all of those have been shown to significantly reduce crime. Now we have a choice in crime policy. We can uh, reduce crime or we can play politics but we can't do both. We have been codifying sound bites and slogans for decades. And the only thing that's gotten us is number one place in incarceration in the world. It's so bad that the Children's Defense Fund calls it the cradle to prison pipeline. So many of our young people are born uh, on the way to prison the day they're born. Uh, most countries lock up about 50 to 200 per 100,000. The United States locks up number one in the world, over 700 per 100,000. In, the minor, in some minority communities, the rate gets above 4,000 per 100,000. 50 to 200 in most, country, in most countries, up to 4,000 in uh, several states in, min, in minority communities. Uh, we know that that's not free. You have to pay for that incarceration. And we also know that it hasn't done much about the crime rate. We do know that, that investments in prevention and early intervention and rehabilitation, investing in an entire continuum from even before the child is born with teen pregnancy prevention to prenatal care, which can reduce mental health and mental retardation uh, problems, uh, services early, very early in the child's life to help the parents avoid uh, child abuse that is so closely correlated with uh, future crime, uh, make sure the children can read by the third grade, make sure they have after-school programs and opportunities all the way through through high school. If they get off track a little bit, make sure you have the services to get them back on track. If they get in trouble, make sure they have the rehabilitation to get back on track. We know that those programs work. They, had, they spent um, about two million dollars in a neighborhood in Richmond, Virginia in my district. Uh, we, there was a 90% reduction in murders from about 17 down to 2. Uh, Philadelphia did the same thing. They invested $60 million in programs around the state. They uh, not only noticed a significant reduction in crime, they also noticed a significant reduction in cost. They, they estimate they, sa they saved over $300 million after they invested $60 million in reducing incarceration costs, uh, uncompensated care at the hospital because fewer people were getting shot, welfare costs for fewer people involved in teen pregnancy. The, the programs that they instituted saved much more money than it cost. Now, some might say, well, we can't afford this. 
Um, we just don't have the money. But it is not a question of whether we're going to pay the money or not. We're already paying. The question is how you pay. Los Angeles County, uh, we estimate, uh, spends approximately $2 billion a year locking people up. Each juvenile, we understand, costs $250,000 a year. Now, we know that if you can reduce crime 50 percent, you would notice that you have a lot of money on the table. The, the um, Youth Promise Act, as you decide what your problem is and come up with an evidence-based solution, one of the thing, first things you do is to put the number on the table of how much money you're spending now in social pathology, such as incarceration and welfare. Put that on the table. And when you're looking at $2 billion and you think you can reduce crime 50 percent, you know not to limit your imagination to programs that cost $250,000. $250 million would not be too much to spend to save a potential billion dollars. So we know that um, you're spending it already. In those areas where you've got the incarceration rate up to 4,000 per 100,000, if you can reduce incarceration just to 1,000, which would be significantly higher than any rate found on earth, you would have enough money to target that extra money to the one-third of the children you identify at risk. You would have approximately $10,000 per child to spend every year. $10,000 per child per year. And if you're spending that kind of money on children, there's no question that you can reduce crime in the 50 percent range. And you can uh, use that money to eliminate the cradle-to-prison pipeline and create a cradle-to-college pipeline or a cradle-to-the-workforce pipeline. It's a lot cheaper. It's a lot cheaper, and it will actually reduce crime. Now, one of the things we have to do is stop going in the wrong direction. Many of these crime bills, as we say, we have a choice. You keep adding more time, more time, spending more, more and more money in incarceration, and the debate is whether you'll have an extra 10 years or an extra 20 years. What we have to do is stop going in the wrong direction altogether. Uh, we have to start focusing our efforts on prevention, early intervention, and rehabilitation, and stop going in the wrong direction. I've told people that even if you can water some of this stuff down, going slower in the wrong direction is not progress. We have to go in the right direction, and we have to wonder what kind of people we are if we're willing to wait until the children mess up in Pennsylvania and spend $300 million rather than invest up front $60 million and actually have a reduction in crime. The Youth Promise Act focuses on more fences, fewer ambulances, and we're confident that the bill will pass this year because of the hard work of officials like Tony Cardenas, and we're pleased to be here uh, with you today to promote the Youth Promise Act and look forward to your action in a few minutes and look forward to listening to the many people that have come out to support the Youth Promise Act. So, Tony, thank you very much for your support. We look forward to the testimony. I want to thank each and every person in the audience for coming out to support common sense, more fences, fewer ambulances. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank everyone who filled out a public comment card. First, we're going to hear from various organizations from the community and departments within the city. We're going to start with calling forward from the Archdiocese Office of Restorative Justice in Los Angeles, Javier Starring. Co-Director, Archdiocese Office of Restorative Justice here in Los Angeles. Come on forward. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, in addition to being co-director of the Office of Restorative Justice, I am also a member of the Restorative Justice Committee for the California Catholic Conference of Bishops, which is the official voice of the Catholic community in California's public policy arena. As people of faith and as citizens, we are called to advocate for policies that reflect our values. This is why we wholeheartedly support the Youth Promise Act. However, I would like to suggest that this event, with all of these wonderful people here today, is much more than a public hearing to express support for a particular law. 
Yes, today we will hear convincing evidence of the efficiency of the Youth Promise Act. Although it is not our common expertise in legislation that unites most of us here today. What unites the majority of us gathered here today is our belief that every child has good within them, and every child has worth, and every child is redeemable. We understand that there are acts committed by our children that are despicable. The acts are despicable, the child is not. We understand that there are acts committed by our children that are beyond redemption. The acts are beyond redemption, the child is not. And we believe this with every tenant of our faith and every fiber of our body. And this is what unites us here today. To be honest, for most of us, the Youth Promise Act is seen as a good step forward, enormously worth celebrating. But we are committed to go much further. We are committed to continue to unite and grow until the promise that we make to our children is that no matter what, they are deserving of and will always have a second chance. This morning, Congressman Scott, Councilman Cardenas, Michael De La Rocha, and Bobby Vesser met with 17 kids at, at Silmar Juvenile Hall. We sat down with them, listened to their stories, and I would say we saw God in them. And the awful reality is that the majority of them, if not all of them, will grow up, will grow old, and they will die in prison. Some for something they did at the age of 14. In the 18 years of ministering to incarcerated youth, I have ac accompanied hundreds of kids, just like the ones that we visited with today, who were sentenced to life in prison. Out of all of those hundreds of youth, only one has been granted the miracle of parole. And it is with enormous gratitude and enormous joy that I introduce you, the miracle child who is no longer a child, my good friend, Elias Elizondo. Welcome. My name is Elias Elizondo. At the age of 16, I was arrested and tried as an adult. I was sentenced to 15 years to life in state prison. Without ever any hope of gaining a parole date, I managed to somehow find the strength through the support of my loving mother, my family, and friends to be able to go on and try and do something productive with my life while I'm in prison. I entered prison, I entered in the juvenile system with the sixth grade education. Obviously, I had been kicked out of many schools. I was your basic juvenile delinquent. However, when I decided to change my life around by the grace of God in prison, I studied hard for nearly four years just to earn a GED. When I finally accomplished that goal in the most adverse of circumstances, I went on and enrolled into the college program that they had instituted in the prison I was at. And I am grateful for that opportunity to be able to go on to the college level because within three years, I was able to earn an Associate of Science degree as well as an Associate of Arts degree, earn my way on the honors list, on the dean's list, and the president's list. An accomplishment. An accomplishment that I never thought was possible. However, the strong support of my family and friends ensured that even if I never came home, that I still did something productive with my life while incarcerated. It was by the grace of God that the parole board, the California Department of Corrections parole board hearings, seen a change in me because they knew that I was a juvenile tried as an adult. The parole board panel members knew and believed that I did deserve a second chance. And I was granted parole in 2007. It was reversed that year by the governor and I did not give up and I continued taking college classes. I continued 
striving forward and was able to gain a second Pro Grant in August of 2008. And once again, like the miracle Javier was speaking about in the prayers of my family, the governor did not reverse his parole date and I was released 34 days ago after serving 16 and a half years in prison. <laughs> There is less than 1% of lifer inmates that are granted parole and actually released. With the Youth Promise Act, I believe that that percentage could rise significantly. If I made it out without the Youth Promise Act, and I am only a less than 1% of the statistics, then I can imagine all the mothers here who have their children in prison, all the mothers here who are going to sleep at night worrying about their children if they will ever get a chance to come home because they're tried as an adult and are facing adult life sentences. I believe that with the Youth Promise Act and the incentive that these juveniles could gain in prison, that those percentages would rise and that these families would be better productive citizens and examples in a support group for their children. And I believe that with this act, that there is many more kids in there, just like I was, who would actually have something tangible to grasp onto and to be able to succeed and gain a grant of parole and be treated differently because they were juveniles tried as adults. They are redeemable, and I say that because I'm sitting with you here today. I was a juvenile tried as an adult, given a life sentence, was granted parole, and now I'm here today to support that act. And I thank everybody here for the opportunity for letting me speak today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that everybody in this room uh, really appreciates uh, the example that you've set. And also there's pain in our heart because we know that you're one of perhaps hundreds and thousands of people that should be given that second chance. So you're a rarity. Uh, I'm going to let you know. You already know this, but I'm going to tell you right here in front of everybody. You have a lot of weight on your shoulders. But Look around you. We're all here for you. We're here for you. Next, uh, Dion Whitfield from the Juvenile Justice Working Group, and also Deborah Davis, Director of Programs, Friends of the Family, and SBA2 co convener for the Children's Council of Los Angeles, and formerly known as Children's Planning Council, and also Kim McGill with the Youth Justice Coalition. Thank you. Please proceed. Thank you. Uh, well, Kim has asked me to speak first, and I don't know if that's just so she can stop shaking. <laughs> um, I am very humbled and honored to be here today to speak for such a wonderful group of people in the community, parents and youth, community-based organizations, and our city and county friends as well, who joined together a couple of years ago and formed the Juvenile Justice Task Force primarily and specifically to bring the voices of youth and families together with city, county, and community because it's together that we will make a difference. It's together we will find the answer. And unfortunately, what happens a lot of times is the voice of community is marginalized. We don't look at them. We look to experts to find the answers rather than to the people who have the answers. When city and county work parallel without integrating resources and services and efforts, we do, as a, as a child development person, I call that parallel play. And as we know as little children, we don't know how to work together Ex exceptionally well until we get wise and grow. We have worked at odds oftentimes, but I am so very, very hopeful in these past few, uh, few years here in Los Angeles that we have been sitting down, to the, down at the table together 
uh, city and county human relations, probation department, many, many uh, community-based organizations and children's council and others to find an answer to how do we support our youth and families. And I want to emphasize that we focus on families as a unit, that we can't just look at youth as being the only focus of this great work that we do. Uh, youth are assets to our communities and institutions. Adults have a civic responsibility to make commitments to youth both in policy and practice. We owe that. These are not gang members first. They are youth and children first. Every young person's life matters equally, including the traditionally excluded youth. All youth must have equitable access and opportunity to achieve their goals, and that's not the case. I have sat with youth, or seen them in a fetal position in our camps and in our halls. Mostly, I work with those parents of those youth. Youth who are facing years in prison, who are 14, who are 15, who are 13. Those parents sought out help most of the time for their child much younger. And they were left with precious little places or resources to go. So they go to the police departments because their children are truant or they're acting out or they can't tell them what to do and they don't know where to go. So they come to the police department, they come to the schools, they ask for help again and again and again, and it's not organized well enough to provide that. And then the parents get blamed. The result is their children enter a quagmire of a juvenile justice system they have no idea how to navigate or how to get out of or how to help their children or how to help themselves or how to even get their other kids from entering that same quagmire. So my question is, what, what that 17-year-old who now faces an uncertain number of years in prison, what he sees is a broad, endless expanse of hopelessness, as you've heard already. How would it have been different if at 13, when he first got in trouble for truancy, his parents had resources in the community they could turn to other than the police? They are blamed. We must focus on supporting the whole family. We must move forward as, as a group of city, county, community. I am so thrilled to know that this, is, this Youth Promise Act is out there. I am uh, I'm hopeful. And I guess I'm a bit of a Pollyanna, but I am hopeful. I do believe we can make a difference. We really can. When we lock up our kids, and I've seen them, and I've sat with them, and I've cried with the parents, with the mothers, with the fathers, who, who have to watch as their children go away for the rest of their lives. How can a 15-year-old conceive of 25 minutes 25 years when they can't even conceive of 25 minutes ahead of time. And I want to suggest that, yes, it is a hate crime that we perpetrate if we lock up a child. And if we do not consider those children in their development, and if we do not do it early on, if we don't invest that money first, in keeping them from going there and supporting families and if we don't stop criminalizing poverty and putting all of our youth of color into prison, I don't know what we'll do as a society, truly. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I really want to thank you, Congressman Scott and Councilman Cardenas and Councilwoman Hahn not just for today, but your leadership on this issue for months now and for all the amazing work of your dedicated staff. So I really want to thank you. 
Um, I want to ask at this time, I'm here representing the Dion Whitfield Work Group, and I want to ask everyone who's helped to build the Dion Whitfield Work Group over the last year to please stand. Um, I've been honored to work with you, and I love you, and you are a great hope for me for the future of LA. Thank you, guys. The Dion Whitfield Work Group was established last spring by youth who were locked up or on probation and the parents of youth facing life and other extreme sentences, community-based organizations, and both city and county officials. It was named for Dion Whitfield, a 17-year-old from Los Angeles County, who was sent to the California Youth Authority, put on nine months of 23 and a half hour a day lockdown without any sunlight or outside recreation or school, was given Prozac, and was found with his cellmate hung in his cell. At the beginning of every meeting, we remember the young people whose lives have been lost on the streets of LA, in our prisons, or deported to countries where they have few resources and few opportunities. At the table of each meeting, we also have law enforcement, social service, probation, and court systems that impact youth every day in our communities. It represents the first time in anyone's memory that youth and their families, rather than only law enforcement, have been honored as the leaders in the movement to challenge LA's and California's addiction to incarceration as the only response to crime and violence. Together, the work group is developing a new vision for public safety and community justice that seeks to give youth a future beyond death in the streets, life behind bars, or deportation to a country where they have neither roots nor resources. We have all worked to support the Youth Promise Act when it came out, when it was first introduced. And we are committed to mobilizing our entire membership, our communities, and our county and state to work toward its passing. We are proud that the City Council is taking this important step in support of the bill. However, we also want to encourage everyone in LA to make the Youth Promise Act real at the local level. We live in a city of broken promises and in a county of broken promises, where legislation crafted in Washington, D.C., or Sacramento, or even City Hall has a very different outcome when it hits the streets. The history of our treatment of youth has been brutal. LA County must apologize first to our own communities and then to the rest of the nation for creating a law and order backlash after the 60s that gave us the first prison expansion, for creating the, the war on drugs, the failed war on drugs, for gang units and gang injunctions and gang databases, for military-style policing, for three strikes in Proposition 21, after 30 years of a multi-billion dollar war on gangs, as Councilwoman Hahn said, we have six times as many gangs and twice as many gang members. So LA passed the Youth Promise Act and, fights for, and fight for its adoption in every corner of the nation. But when it hits LA, we must work together to make this promise real. Promise to build a joint city-county department of youth development to distribute funds, training, and resources so we can make youth work excellent, and end the gang-banging within government that is taking lives. <laughs> Promise tens of thousands of youth jobs, starting with a job for everyone coming home from the halls or camps immediately upon their release. Promise a youth center in every community, open 3 p.m. to midnight, 365 days a year. We just visited a youth center today at Nickerson Gardens where we live very close to it. The walls are covered with the names of young people that have been killed, and they just lost 20 hours a week in service due to budget cuts. Promise 500 gang intervention workers on the streets, not the 60 or so that we have now, with a living wage, health care, and life insurance. Promise to ban the box, asking about convictions on job applications, starting with city and county applications, so people with records can survive outside the street economy. And start with the young <laughs> And start with those young men and women and young people who are on the front lines of forest fires every day, battling those fires from prisons, but then come back to LA County and LA City and can't even be considered for a city or county fire department job. Promise to replace zero tolerance and drug sniffing dogs in our schools and the school to jail track with college and career preparation for every young person in LA. <laughs> Pro
promised to end the extreme sentencing of youth, including the use of life without parole in California and across the nation. We could pay for all of these things tomorrow, not only by passing the Youth Promise Act, but if we took only 1%, just 1% of the budgets of the LAPD, county sheriffs, county courts, and Department of Probation, we could pay for all of these things tomorrow. We could pay for a youth center. In fact, we could pay for six full comprehensive youth centers open 365 days a year if we took only the cleaning bill, the stipends that are given to law enforcement officers to clean their uniforms. Most of all, without spending even one cent, promise to honor the youth and families most impacted by violence, incarceration, and deportation. Honor their voices, follow their visions, and provide them real opportunities to design and run the programs that will save lives and uplift communities. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. <clears throat> Next. Next. I'd like to call up um, Mayor's Office of Gang Reduction and Youth Development, uh, Jeff Carr, Director of Mayor's Office of Gang Reduction and Youth Development. Thank you, Jeff. I think it's, a, it, it's good to be here. It's an unfair advantage to ever have to follow Kim in any <laughs> hearing. Uh, Councilman Cardenas, Councilwoman Hahn, and Councilman Reyes, and Congressman Scott, it's good to be here today. And um, I do think um, we're at a at coming close to a tipping point, um, hopefully in this country, but in this county, in the city, to, to start moving in a direction. It's moving too slow, but I think we're moving in a positive direction. Um, as you, as Councilwoman Hahn said, we had 2,300 votes short of 66 percent of the people of this city say they were willing to tax themselves, their property, to invest in prevention and intervention. Um, we put some more money into the um, budget. The mayor put more money, $5 million into the budget last year for prevention and intervention, and you'll see that money protected in this year's budget when we're facing serious budget cuts ac across the city. Um, we have a chief of police who has said very publicly that we can't arrest our way out of this problem and is actually working very well. I, I think in, in uh, everyone would agree the police department is working closer with the community than probably has ever, certainly in years. Um, but we need help from the federal government. There's no question we need help from federal government on a number of things, and we need resources to be able to do the kind of things that Kim talked about and I think we want to see in this city and this county. And I, um, before I talk specifically about the Summer Night Lights program, which uh, the councilman asked me to talk about, I, I hope that um, the federal government, similar to what Kim said our local government needs to do, we can stop the gang banging there as well. And we can find ways to work together in Congress and we can find uh, ways to work together in, with local jurisdictions to get the kind of resources and the investments we need on the prevention intervention side. Um, in 2002, then Councilman uh, Martin Ludlow actually decided to, in his district, in the 10th Council District, he started a program called Summer of Success with a very simple notion, which was to take uh, the Jim Gilliam Park, which is at the base of the Baldwin Hills in the, in the Baldwin Village area, and engage the local young people, young men and women in that particular community, some of them who actually were involved in gangs, um, many who were not, and engage them in actually turning the park into an, uh, a nighttime place during the most violent time of the summer to give young people an opportunity to use the park for what it was intended to be used for, which was for positive youth development and recreation. Um, during the course of that eight-week time, we saw nearly a 20% reduction in gang-related um, crime in that particular targeted neighborhood. Many people over the last number of years have talked about that was one of the examples of the kind of positive youth development and prevention uh, investments we should be making in this city. So last summer um, we decided very quickly um, to figure out how to do that. There was no money in the budget to be able to do that and so um, our office took it upon ourselves to go out and raise a million dollars of private money to see if we could take that model that had been, been done in Jim Gilliam and take it to, um, to seven additional 
parks and see if we could do that very similar. And it was a very simple concept. All we said was let's take back some of our parks where actually some of the violence um, is most acute in our city, take back those public spaces and engage young people and families in those particular neighborhoods and make investments in them and keep those spaces open into the late hours of the evening until midnight during the most violent time of the year, which is in Los Angeles from 4th of July to Labor Day is historically the most violent time of the year. And actually Wednesday night through Saturday night is the most violent time of the week. And so we did three simple things. Number one was to say we're going to expand the programming in the hours of those parks and give people something to do. The second thing was we wanted to make those parks a place where they were actually um, open for everyone in the community, whether they were victims, potential victims of violence, or potential perpetrators of violence. With the caveat that we said if you come to this park, you are here to participate in the positive, the positive things in this community, you're welcome. If you're going to hear, be here to perpetrate violence, you're not welcome. We then engaged 10 young people between the ages of 17 and 20, um, paid them $3,000 for the summer and said, we believe that you actually have the opportunity to write a new story of not only about your own life, but about the life of this neighborhood, and engage them to be a part of the solution. They did outreach in these, in these uh, communities to people to invite them to come to the parks. Then they actually helped run the program in the parks. We trained them for two weeks before they got started to really help them catch a vision for what they could do in their neighborhood. And then we also engaged gang intervention workers, many ex-gang members, to said, look, let's work with the local street gangs, and we're not asking them to do anything other than for these eight weeks to stop shooting at one another and to make the park a place where it's off limits to violence and give people safe passage to and from the park. For all eight of those parks together, it cost us less than a million dollars. Um, during the course of those eight weeks in places, I remember people, some people said to me, oh, people will never come to some of the parks that you're choosing, Jeff, and we did it in one public housing project. People won't come out at, uh, at night, and if somebody does come out at night, one uh, particularly friendly woman said, you know, someone's going to get killed, Reverend, and the blood will be uh, on your hands. Well, I'm proud to say that during those eight weeks, we had over 50,000 visits in those eight weeks uh, to those eight parks. Um, we had a 17% reduction during those eight weeks in gang-related violent crime. We had one homicide, only one homicide compared to seven in not only in the, the police reporting districts where the parks were, but the surrounding reporting districts as well. All of that for under a million dollars. This year we decided we were going to expand that and we've targeted 15 um, uh, locations this coming summer with an investment of $2.6 million, of which again, half of that we're going to raise from the private sector. I'm going to raise from the private sector to match uh, a $1.3 million investment on the public sector. But we've just done a little bit of looking around. There's probably 80 different parks and recreation facilities, 80 to 100 park and rec facilities that would um, warrant a program like this in the summer. There's all of the housing projects in the city of Los Angeles could certainly warrant a pro program like this. It would cost us between 15 to $20 million to do that in pretty much every neighborhood housing project in this city and run a program like that during the course of the two months in the summertime, which is the hottest, most violent time of the year, for 15 to 20 million. Imagine the kind of results we could get if we were able to spread that, not just to double the number of sites this summer from 8 to 15, but to literally take that and spread it all across the city. Um, and I hope as the Youth Promise Act um, works its way through Congress and there's a debate there um, that you'll consider uh, this is one of the many things that we can do in this country, particularly in the most violent time of the year, um, to, to really reduce the levels of violence in our city and really give young people a chance. I think the most important thing to me was the 80 young people that we um, were able to hire, the 17 to 20 year olds. Uh, I was there the week then they got trained and, and they were sort of a ragtag bunch of young people. You know, um, some of them had a little bit of attitude and by the end of the summer to see that when we had them here in council and uh, they were given a presentation for what they'd accomplished, to see the, the difference in their gait, um, the way they carried themselves, the pride that they had for their own neighborhoods, um, and the good that they were doing, even though some of them may have been involved in the past in perpetrating some problems, um, it's exactly that kind of investment and stake that we need to give young people in our city and around our country in their own neighborhoods because if we don't engage them, 
in proactive, positive ways, we will never be able to end the curse of violence that is, is ongoing in so many of our communities around the city and around the country. So um, thanks for letting me be here today and, and proud to be a, a part of this committee hearing. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Ms. Hahn. Thank you. I uh, just want to let everybody know that uh, I have another commitment, which I'm, I'm leaving for right now. Bourbon Day High School in Watts uh, is having a very special event tonight where we're raising money for scholarships for the young men of Watts uh, to achieve their dreams. And since we're talking about the Youth Promise Act, I better not break that promise of telling them that I would be there tonight. But I really want to uh, thank everyone who came here tonight uh, to speak to us. And Congressman Scott, you've got my full support uh, for the Youth Promise Act. And anything we can do uh, to help you in that, we will. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Hunt. Yeah. What we're going to do is we're going to open the role in the committee uh, so Ms. Hahn can vote uh, before she leaves. So with that, uh, before we finish testimony on the item, uh, we're going to open the roll. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So this item will be, when it moves out of this committee, will be approved by the majority. Yes. I want to um, specify that you are approving the corrected resolution. Yes, I'm sorry, the corrected uh, resolution. Yes, the updated Thank you, version. Thank you. Thank From the CLA's you. office. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hunt. Um, with that, um, before we go to our next presenters, we actually have um, a couple of people who are uh, officials uh, for within the city. Uh, Michael Nash, who's a uh, presiding judge, please come forward. And also Michael Judge, not to be confused with Judge Nash. One is title, one is name. Come forward to the, to the table, please. You two know each other? Yeah. <laughs> we get confused though and mistaken for each other all the time. Thank you for being with us. And, and please, I hope you can uh, uh, let both of you in your respective roles and responsibilities uh, in, in if you can let us know the size of the organization that you preside over and then also um, how it compares with uh, the size of are you the largest in the country? I mean, where do you rank when it comes to uh, the size of, of the, the organization that you preside over? Please. All right. His name well, is, uh, I was going to say good afternoon, but it's now good evening, uh, Councilman Cardenas and Councilman Reyes. And uh, also good evening, uh, Congressman Scott, and welcome to Los Angeles. My name is Michael Nash, and I'm the presiding judge of the juvenile court in Los Angeles County. I've been a judge since 1985, a juvenile court judge since 1990, and either a supervising judge of our juvenile dependency court or presiding judge of our entire juvenile court since uh, 1995. I also wear a couple of other hats. I'm currently the chair of the Juvenile Court Judges of California, which is a uh, section of the California Judges Association. And I'm secretary of the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges, an organization that's known to Congressman Scott, and we certainly have appreciated your support. Los Angeles, as you might imagine, has the largest juvenile court system in the United States. Our juvenile court is divided into three systems. We have our juvenile dependency court, which hears all the cases of abuse and neglect uh, of children. Our dependency court consists of 20 full-time courts and currently, at least our last, the last number that I had from our last count last month, we have 25,245 ch 249 children under that court's jurisdiction because of abuse or neglect. While that number is likely the highest in the nation, it is also the lowest number that we've seen in decades here in Los Angeles. In 1998, that number exceeded over 53,000, so we've moved in the right direction in the last 10 years plus. Uh, our other division is the Informal Juvenile and Traffic Court, which consists of 13 courts, which are scattered at 11 locations around our county. It hears traffic offenses for youth under the age of 18 and other minor offenses heard in informal proceedings, things such as daytime loitering, 
commonly known as truancy, uh, and uh, curfew violations, among other things. Uh, last year, those courts heard approximately 180,000 citations, only one-third of which were traffic-related. It's a very important court because it serves as the gateway to the court system for so many youth, and yet uh, it is our most understaffed and under-resourced uh, court. Our third division, which most people are familiar with, is our delinquency court. In Los Angeles, we have 28 full-time delinquency courts at 10 locations around our county. Currently, we have over 20,000 youth on probation in Los Angeles County. Of those, there are about 1,500 youth at our three juvenile halls, one of which you visited today, I believe. Uh, another 1,700 at our uh, 18 probation camps, and another 13 to 1,500 youth in suitable placements. And this doesn't include uh, the youth that uh, uh, are committed to our state institution, the Department of Juvenile Justice. These uh, 4,500 or, 4, or so youth uh, are the recipient of and in the need of the greatest percentage of the resources that we have available to us. Now, our law in California, specifically California Welfare and Institutions Code Section 202B, states in part, Minors under the jurisdiction of the juvenile court as a consequence of delinquent conduct shall, in conformity with the interests of public safety and protection, receive care, treatment, and guidance that is consistent with their best interest and that, that holds them accountable for other, their behavior and that is appropriate for their circumstances. It further states, when the minor is no longer a ward of the juvenile court, the guidance he or she received should enable him or her to be a law-abiding and productive member of his or her family and the community. In Los Angeles, around the rest of the state of California, I'm sure, uh, and elsewhere, uh, you, you might argue uh, that we do a fair job on the accountability piece. I guess we can match our numbers of prosecuting youth and removing them from the community with anybody else's numbers. However, when it comes to serving youth in the community or in our institutions, we fall, short, fall, fall far short of providing the care, treatment, and guidance that is consistent with their best interest that enables them to become law-abiding and productive members of their family and their community. The problem has been the emphasis on the former, that is the accountability, as opposed to the latter, the service piece. We either have no programs, programs that do not work, or too few programs that are research-based and designed to help uh, uh, our youth who are either in our system or, or exiting our system after we've had the opportunity to provide appropriate services to them. H.R. 3846, the uh, Youth Promise Act, I believe, appears to take the right approach. Funding for prevention and intervention strategies that, uh, are, that include uh, proven and promising uh, uh, services and strategies that are designed or tailored to the needs of individual communities, that have standards for evaluation to ensure that they are working, uh, that is precisely what uh, Los Angeles and communities all around the country need. In Los Angeles, we are trying to redirect, re redirect our efforts towards more towards evidence-based programs and promising practices to serve youth in our camps, our placements, and our community placements, and also to develop successful re-entry plans for youth returning to the communities and exiting our system. I think H.R. 3846 can assist us in these goals. Congressman, I wish you great luck with this forward-thinking bill, and I can promise you that I will urge my colleagues both on the state and national level to support this as well. Thank you for visiting us here, and thank you, Councilman Cardenas, for your longstanding and continuing concern for our youth and our community. Thank you, Judge Nash. Thank you, uh, Councilman Reyes, for your interest here, and uh, especially you, Councilman 
caught in this as you have actually reached out to us in the LA County Public Defender's Office uh, and involved us in many of your efforts on behalf of the children. Uh, and also, of course, to you, Congressman Bobby Scott. Um, as I had the opportunity to relate to you earlier, um, as a member of the American Council of Chief Defenders, uh, I urged uh, the organization to endorse the Youth Promise Act, uh, and in fact they did. Also as the legislative chair for the California Public Defenders Association, uh, I did likewise, and they are on board in full support. The LA County Public Defender's Office is the largest local public defender's office in the world. It's the oldest. We were established in 1914. I first practiced in juvenile delinquency court in 1969, and I've been back a number of times, and I have a particular interest uh, in children. Um, we have been able uh, to demonstrate what can happen if these children are properly assessed, and then if we design services, treatment, remedial education, whatever is mental health care, substance abuse care, whatever is necessary, and things that they are entitled to, like special education, they thrive, they flourish. We have been able to provide that sort of service utilizing licensed clinical social workers to do the assessments and then presenting to the court a package of local community-based services, treatment, education, and the like. And the courts have actually uh, adopted our recommendations in, in over 90 percent of the cases where we do that. And, and the results, the outcomes are phenomenal. The children really do well. We've also looked at failed placements, children that somehow went through the system and never were assessed and never got what they needed or should have had. And in conjunction with probation, um, partnering in identifying these children, we have gotten over 700 of them out of the placements they were in, like camp, where they're actually locked up, uh, and providing them with the proper services, even at a late date, makes a big difference in terms of the outcomes, and many of them do well. Because of what we demonstrated, <clears throat> the California Legislature and the Judicial Council changed the ambit of the responsibilities of lawyers that practice in the delinquency system in California. And now, the relationship between the attorney and the child no longer terminates upon disposition of the case. In fact, we are now yoked with the responsibility, and I'm glad we are, of monitoring the situation afterwards to ascertain if they're getting the programmatic resources that were intended, the treatment, the education, whatever it was, and if they're not, to bring the case back to court for further orders. We're even, we even have a unit that go to our juvenile prisons in California. It used to be called our Youth Authority. Now it's the Division of Juvenile Justice. And we have gotten children removed from those settings when they weren't getting what they needed in order to function properly and to have a chance of reintegrating and reentering society uh, and, and doing so uh, in, in a way that they had a chance of success. Um, the other part of it is that uh, lawyers practicing in the delinquency courts now have the responsibility for identifying children who ought to be assessed, getting them the assessments, and doing the advocacy necessary. This includes, unfortunately, in some cases, situations where schools refuse to provide special education when the child is entitled to it. So we have special advocates in my office that take on any recalcitrant school districts and compel them to provide the services, including suing them if necessary. Um, it makes a huge difference, but it needs to be financed because we need to do even more. And, and our office has been cited by Congress as an office that demonstrates the best practices in the nation, and still we don't have enough resources to serve all the children that we believe ought to get it. What happens, and I've seen this over the years, is a child very often progresses from being abandoned, neglected, or abused, and then some minor thing happens, but they somehow then trip into the delinquency system, and now they're bad. 
and now they're no longer abandoned, neglected, or abused. They're just bad. That's a very dangerous thing. What the Youth Promise Act does is this. It's a simple matter. The question is, are we going to invest or are we going to spend the taxpayers' money? The Youth Promise Act invests the money, invests the money currently for future positive outcomes. Instead of simply stigmatizing, marginalizing, and demonizing our children, it focuses on achieving durable positive outcomes for the children, their families, and their communities, which enhances public safety. It's cost effective, much more cost effective than the alternatives. It's humane. It heals communities as it simultaneously stabilizes communities. And it also acts as providing a full spectrum of approaches along with the traditional suppression that is so very well financed. Adding the Youth Promise Act to that provides a continuum that is much more likely to be successful than simply having all of the emphasis placed in one response. So I'm a personal supporter of the Youth Promise Act, um, and I will do whatever I can to assist you in getting it enacted. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you both very much. I think it's important for everybody in this room to understand how unique you two individuals are. You preside and are responsible for two of the largest departments of your kind in the country, and yet you chose not to look at your responsibilities as black and white. You chose to look at your responsibilities as they are. You're dealing with human beings and you have created models that are uh, commended uh, from Washington to local governments and organizations at the state level and around the country. And I just want to let, let everybody know we are the largest county in the country. If we didn't have these two gentlemen doing the things that they're doing the way they are doing, if you don't like our system right now, it would be a thousand times worse. So I'd like to take this unprecedented opportunity of a committee like this to ask that we give them a hand. I'd like to at this time Um, I'd like to, at this point in time, ask another unique, very special individual within our, our city family to come forward, and that is the Rabbi Freeling, Executive Director of the City's Human Relations Commission. A congressman. If I may, I'd like to begin as a rabbi and not as a city department head. Uh, to remind you that in Scripture, the prophets warn that if there is a community that does not speak for those who do not have an opportunity to give voice, to not give vision to those who are blinded, uh, to those who do not listen carefully, that community ultimately will fail. I believe, sir, that you've come here uh, not only to gain uh, support for your magnificent piece of legislation, uh, but to realize that you are dealing with one of many, many communities. Uh, Congressman, if I may, I'd like to begin as a rabbi and not as a city department head uh, to remind you that in Scripture, the prophets warn that if there is a community that does not speak for those who do not have an opportunity to give voice, to not give vision to those who are blinded, 
uh, to those who do not listen carefully, that community ultimately will fail. I believe, sir, that you've come here uh, not only to gain uh, support for your magnificent piece of legislation, uh, but to realize that you are dealing with one of many, many communities which will benefit from your efforts. And should you ever be tired, and should you ever wonder whether the energies that you're expending to see to it that your colleagues in the Congress and in the Senate join you in this effort, remind yourself that you are speaking for those who are voiceless, that you are seeing things that people who are blinded to stereotypes cannot, and that you are really listening to a number of people from the City of Angels who themselves are angels in their own right. Because what you have in this room at this moment is a collection of people who truly believe that they are doing good in God's name, just as you are. I will tell you, sir, that my experience as a rabbi for many years, 30 of them here in Los Angeles before coming to this building to take on the responsibilities which are mine in 2002. I will tell you, sir, that what we are desperately in need of is that which you are championing in Washington. And if, in fact, you need allies in communities across America, not only listen to and remember that which you are seeing at this very moment, uh, but know that available to you is a filmed record of this extraordinary event because it is being carried and it is being recorded by our own city, Channel 35. It may very well be that excerpts of this hearing, seen and witnessed by your colleagues who may for one reason do not have the passion which is yours, can change minds. And if that's not enough, a call from you will have several of us at our own expense coming to Washington to say to your colleagues that the time is now for them to take on the task of finally making this a holistic community, not just of Los Angeles, but the entire nation, a nation which has had enough bloodshed, a nation which has had enough violence, a nation which has had enough hopelessness, a nation which at long last is not disregarding the needs of its young people, but is finally and at long last uniting its voices, uniting its hearts and minds, uniting its passion to finally act, as you are acting, sir, as a responsible individual, adult and leader, speaking for the children of this nation, which desperately need to hear that there are those of us who care, those of us who stand with them, to make their lives different than the lives of those older brothers and sisters and parents who have led lives in gangs because they felt that there was no alternative. You, sir, are the vehicle which will show them that there is a viable option, just as we have Tony Cardenas leading the way in our own city of angels. Thank you for being here. Thank, thank you, Rabbi. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. We have exactly one hour before we have to um, adjourn this meeting, not because I want to, it's just the logistics of the fact that we are in the council chambers. This is a special meeting, and we had to arrange uh, um, for it to be opened for a certain amount of time, so we have exactly an hour. So the next presentations, if he spe each speaker can uh, make their presentation between three and five minutes, we will be able to get through all the speakers and then the public comment cards uh, of the general public afterwards. So at this time, I'd like to ask uh, 
from the to speak on the community-based gang intervention model. Gregory Thomas from Gang Interventionist Cush Incorporated, and also Robert Hernandez, uh, Director Communities and Schools. Come forward, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, certainly, it's an honor. Uh, Congressman Scott having the opportunity to see you uh, today in the Watts community and tour several locations that we provide services and have you meet some of the additional service providers. Uh, we definitely uh, appreciate your presence and appreciate your vision behind the Youth Promise Act. Uh, as uh, Chairman Cardin has uh, mentioned, my name is Gregory Thomas, and I am here on behalf of a dozen or so community-based gang intervention agencies who risk their lives every day so that our community streets and children are safe and free of the fear of gang-related and motivated violence. This evening, I've been tasked with defining gang intervention and to expound on the significance of prong one of the gang intervention model. As I mentioned on numerous occasions, the Community Engagement Advisory Committee decided in crafting the gang intervention working definition that it was imperative to formulate something that would be transparent enough for a third grader to read and thereby comprehend. Henceforth, the community-based gang intervention definition e evolved and it reads as follows. Gang intervention is a two-pronged approach that provides hardcore, specialized, street-based mediation and mitigation to stop or prevent violence between gangs and the concurrent redirection of individual gang members and their families in ways that bring progress to themselves and their communities. So what are some of the components that make up prong one of the gang intervention model? Gregory, Gregory. Before, before you proceed with that, I, I think it's appropriate at this moment to ask all the individuals and agencies who make up the Community Engagement Advisory Committee and who worked on creating this model to please stand and be recognized. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you once again for your unprecedented work uh, not only on a daily basis, but the, the actual model that was created by you individuals. Thank you very much. Please proceed, Gregory. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I certainly didn't want to overshadow the significance of the contributions that each of those individuals made. It was a long, arduous process, several months in the making, weekly. Folks committed their time uh, without any compensation, and, and, and it's, it's, it was certainly uh, a great accomplishment for the practitioners and certainly great leadership on your behalf, Mr. Chairman. And so the, one of the concepts that define this model is license to operate, which is essential because it requires a gang intervention worker, first of all, to have credibility in the community. In addition, that credibility is, is, is compounded with trust and respect. You see, when we talk about hardcore street-based gang intervention, we're actually talking about having a relationship with the individuals who are most likely to shoot and kill. And without a relationship with these individuals, then quite frankly, it's, it's difficult to reduce the gang-related motivated violence uh, in these at-risk communities. So with the license to operate, the individuals are seen as, as the go-to person, the intervention worker, somebody that the potential shooter can rely on to give him viable alternatives to resolve the situation in other than resulting to violence. Uh, other components that are associated with, associated with prong one of the model are street mediation, uh, developing local and re regional truces, uh, peace agreement maintenance. Each of these components are just as important because with the street mediation, it's a constant thing. People think because there's no violence going on, then there's no intervention work being done. Well, a lot of the intervention work that's being done is behind the scenes because when you get the individuals to stand down and not shoot and kill, now you have to engage on a daily basis in the street mediation to, you know, listening, look, listening, determining what conflicts may arise, what individuals are going through, and then you're able to jump in and resolve the situation before it takes off to what we, what we call level 10, and that is complete uh, violence. In addition to that, we have what we call crisis intervention. 
which is another, another word for conflict resolution. As we know, crises evolve. So what happens? Well, we're on the phone 24-7. We're talking. We're communicating. We're sharing ideas. We're sharing information. So that in the heat of the crises, you know, individuals, the, the damage won't be, uh, won't be as crucial as we're experiencing. And then with, and with the crises intervention comes rumor control. You know, of course, po folks talk about who's shooting who, who shot him, he shot her, and we have to do a, uh, an enormous job of quelling rumors so that people understand clearly that what the facts are and that they won't decide to engage in conflict or violent behavior with people who have nothing to do with what the situation is about. And then, of course, there's a the community engagement, community engagement and community conflict resolution. And then finally, the enforcement of school, safe response zones, and supportive services for youth and families affected by gang violence. All of, things, all of these things could happen in a day. As you saw, Mr. Chairman, when we were in the WASC community and one of the intervention workers was pointing out to you how that's my, that's my case, uh, that's, she, that person's on my uh, case, case file. That person, I just got him a job. That person just got off parole. That person is sitting and working right now. You know, all of those, they were pointing out all of the, the dynamics of prong one. And, and it's ironic that uh, you had the opportunity to witness that because it's something that actually goes on in the, on the daily life of the gang intervention worker. So what am I saying? Well, I'm saying that uh, on behalf of the gang intervention uh, committee, uh, we fervently believe that the breadth and depth of service provided by gang intervention agencies surpasses the concepts that I just expounded on because we know that most active gang members don't just wake up and decide that they no longer want to engage in gang-related motivated violence. The substance abuse theory suggests that some people don't just see the light and change. They first have to feel the heat. Conversely, we all know the story about Apostle Paul on his way to Damascus, Damascus to persecute Christians. You know, prior to becoming Paul, he was, he was Saul. He was one of the chief persecutors of Christians. But somehow, someway, Paul was, a light was shined on Paul. And, 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 and he was brought to some realization, some awakening, awakening of consciousness that that perhaps was not the best course of action for him to take. And of course, history tells us that Apostle Paul, Apostle Saul, who later became Apostle Paul, uh, turned out to be one of the chief advocates for the gospel in terms of providing a better quality of life for humanity as we know it. And, 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 and most of what we read today in the Bible is a direct reflection about the good work that Apostle Paul has done to help transform human life as we know it. And similarly, we can uh, suggest that prong one of the gang venture model, aside from the concepts and definitions that, it, that drives it, is inspired by the men and women who, like Apostle Paul, saw the light and wanted nothing more than to let their light or life's work shine so bright that others may be drawn to it and embrace what, have, what we have come to believe is the best course of action for many being raised in asset-challenged, gang-infested communities throughout our city. That is to believe that there are viable alternatives to gang-related motivated violence, and those alternatives in many cases rest with the very people who were the perpetrators and have now come home to lead the movement for a better quality of life for those who believe violence is the only answer to life challenges. So I say this, it all comes, the, the prong one on the gang intervention model in my assessment comes down to the three R's, remorse, rehabilitation, and redemption. That's the spirit that drives the individuals that, that, are, that have committed their lives to this work. It is the spirit that is being transferred to individuals in the streets who see through the work that the interventions, hardcore street-based intervention is due, that there is an alternative, alternative to engaging in senseless, gang-related, motivated violence. And it is, it is that spirit that is going to allow us to move this work forward and help transform our city as we know it. And with that, Chairman, I yield to uh, Robert Hernandez, who's going to talk about prong two of the gang intervention model. Councilman Cardenas, Congressman Mabek Scott. Um, I just want to say thank you again, Congressman, for making this trip. As I expressed to you earlier, it's, it seems, uh, it saddens me to, to see that as a society we've kind of settled for lockdown facilities to tend to our youth. And through your piece of legislation, which is very progressive, there's hope for us. 
so thank you. Um, again, the gang interventionists that are here, I can't go without acknowledging their presence, all of them here. Without the gang interventionists, they are crucial to this gang intervention model. Their value is incredible. I can't even explain in words. Um, brief visual so you could see how it actually works and operates. Uh, case manager, social worker goes out and starts working with the at-risk youth who's acting out behavior at school. The social worker, case manager starts to work with that youth, stabilize that youth. Everything's fine. They're producing in school. All of a sudden, as they're doing home visits, they find out that the kid's spinning out of control. What's going on? We just were working with this child in fifth grade. Later, we find out the social worker case manager goes up and finds out that the older brother, our uncle, was just released from prison or a juvenile detention center. They're spinning out of control. The family system's in chaos. What happens goes back, calls a gang interventionist to go with that social worker case manager. What do they do? They start working with that person that was just released from detention because nine out of ten times they know who that person is they know what set that person's from they start to stabilize that family system by linking up to supportive services like jobs re-enrolling them back into school so the thing here is that we are talking about servicing gang involved gang affiliated youth I hate to label but they are usually neglected services I sit here as a social worker person of color, male, Latino, graduated from a prestigious university, USC School of Social Work, but I'm challenged to work with this population. What my colleague here expressed earlier is that they have the credibility of the streets, the license to operate, the ability to allow me to provide them services. This is a population that has been neglected services that suffer from high rates of post-traumatic stress disorder, mood disorders, depression, ADHD, and usually it's you know looked at as oppositional defiant conduct disorder. So what happens is they establish the trust and the relationship that's needed. It's a key variable. It could be considered, and it is considered a best practice, effective practice, because through that relationship the gang interventionist has established, I'm able to pr provide them services and link them to supportive services, to job development programs, to case management, to tattoo removal, everything to have them strengthen their lives through strength-based models to build their internal, external resources, to build capacity, to make them independent of the gang, to re-engage them back into our society, in our community, as active participants. That's what the gang intervention model, two-prong approach does, and the effectiveness it has. There's so many stories, and our colleagues here could attest to how effective this model is. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next, to speak on the importance of arts and culture, we have uh, award-winning author Luis Rodriguez and also Fidel Rodriguez, uh, County Commission on Human Relations and Homeboy Industries. Yes, Congressman, go ahead. As they're coming forward, um, I've been given a lot of credit for drafting this bill. I need to introduce the uh, Chief Counsel of the Crime Subcommittee, Bobby Vassar, who has been working on this since the very beginning. And another person that's been at this from the very beginning, Carol Shawtroff from the Human Rights uh, Watch, is with us today. She's been working on this since before the bill had a name. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman. Thank you for, for uh, clarifying that and, and also acknowledging the individuals who have worked very hard on this legislation that, as well as you. Didn't stand up. Can you stand up so people know who you are? Carol Shadra. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Carol. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Councilman Cardenas, uh, Congressman Scott, uh, for this opportunity. I want to say something that has not been said yet because I ob obviously agree with everything everybody's talked about, but there's an aspect that I want to emphasize. But I want to start by saying that, you know, I've had 35 years working in this area. When you got 35 years, you see a lot of things. Um, this city has been uh, some of the most frustrating communities I've ever had to work in because I've also spent 15 years doing this in Chicago. But as also in Los Angeles, I see a very important light. I see something new happening. I see a new imagination beginning to develop. And it's something that I've always thought I would want to see and that I would see. I never thought I would ever see. And I want to thank Councilman Cardenas and the work of the Ad Hoc Committee because I think they're one of the lights that are helping us understand what we need to do. And yeah, and, uh, and the Youth Promise Act to me is just the, the combination of so many years of work of so many people. And you know in Chicago, as, uh, as you probably are aware, the, the gang situation is tremendous there. I worked in the community Humboldt Park and, and uh, Logan Square that was at one point more gangs than any other city in the uh, community in the country. Uh, we did a number of things there, including the Crease the Peace Network. I also started Youth Struggling for Survival there. Uh, one year I raised $180,000 for the Humble Park Teen Reach. The goal was always the whole person and the wholeness of community. The goal was always how do you bring everything together, not just pieces of it. And one of the things that I want to say is a glue in helping us do this is the arts, literacy, the cultural and spiritual aspects of this work. I know that the Youth Promise Act is probably not going to directly uh, address this. I want to address it because I think it's vital for everything. The work that I do, I have a, a, a culture center, the Echucha Center Cultural and Bookstore. It's the only full, complex cultural space in the Northeast Valley, the only bookstore in the Northeast Valley of the San Fernando Valley. 450,000 people with no bookstore, no culture space, no art gallery until we open our doors. It's about the size of the city of Oakland. It's worse than South Central, it's worse than East LA. There's no bookstores, no places for kids to go, if, even if they wanted literacy, even if they wanted books. Uh, I happen to be a writer of books, and I bought three of them. These are the ones I've written about gangs. Uh, this one, Always Running, happens to be, I, I've been told by from the public library system, the most checked out book in the library system. I'm also told it's the most stolen book. <laughs> and, um, no, 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 they didn't, it, they didn't steal it, they misplaced it. That's, how, that's right. But I bring that up because I think that why would kids steal a book? Well, there's two things. One, they, love, they want to read what's in it, which most books, by the way, are just not meaningful for them. Not that it can't be, but they don't have the books that they can relate to in front of them. The second thing, though, is that they cannot buy these books in their neighborhoods. I have a book called The Republic of East LA. Where in East LA can you buy that book? It's just a shame that we don't even have the literacy centers, the culture centers, the art places. And I'm not talking about arts and crafts as a nice thing to do. I'm talking about the creative imagination that you engage when young people are alive with their own purpose and meaning and the ability to shape their world. And, um, and I want to bring this up because I know it might be forgotten in the midst of all these things because we need all this. We need the jobs. We need the training. We need the, the pipeline to the schools. We need all these things, but we got to be able to point out that if you don't address the wholeness of a person, you also have to address the spiritual part of them, the part of them that has to sing when everything else is so dark and there's no song. The part of them that has to plant a seed when there's nothing but dryness in the world, when it's like a desert. And I've told young people this because they've come to me and they're tired, they're depressed, and they say, oh, I can't do nothing. I go, well, here's one thing I learned in 35 years doing this work. If there's a desert, you plant that plant. You plant that seed. You don't let any desert go by without something beautiful coming in. And that's what young people want to hear. Because I am convinced that if we do not address and deal with their beauty, their inner beauty, their gifts that they bring into this world, they will turn those things to violence. And we have seen it over and over again. So I, I want to open it up to the rest of these young people. I don't really like to talk a lot. I just always try to say what I need to say. But I want to quote one very important person. Um, she happens to be my wife, Trini who is uh, very active in the community, a founder of Tia Chuchas, and is right now, she would be here today, but she's right now, we're gonna have a new space for people who don't know. We got pushed out of a space. What's happening in LA is that we're losing our cultural spaces, our bookstores. 
We, lo we lost the Midnight Special. We lost Under the Bridge. We lost Dutton's. We lost Bohemia Books. We're losing all these spaces. We almost got lost ourselves, Thea Chuch, as we got pushed out for a laundromat, a high-end laundromat. Who's going to safeguard these spaces? Who's going to make sure that we have the bookstores, cultural spaces, art galleries, the mural painting classes, the music classes? We have to ensure that this happens. And Trini right now is working on this because um, we've got a new space. We're moving even though there's hardly any money, even though we put two mortgages on our house. I don't mind. It's important for us to commit, and this is our commitment. But I want to quote her because to me it's one of the most important quotes. And she said it at a meeting. She says, don't go by what is, go by what can be. And to me, this is where really your act, the Youth Promise Act, the work of this, this committee is really about, not just going by what is, but going by what can be. If the imagination is not in the forefront of this, we would just do the same old thing. As you know, there's been a lot of programs. There's been a lot of money. I call most of them, I hate to say this, um, but I think they're um, um, organized inadequacies. And we don't want that anymore. We want the real thing. We want real engagement, real commitment. I really believe that young people should be at that table, as you mentioned, because young people themselves have the answers already. And you talk to them, they will tell you what needs to be done. And I, I wish that the young warriors, the group that we're with, were here today, they were going to come and their car broke down. They have these issues. They cannot always do things, but they will step up if we step up. They will put forward the solutions, because I truly believe they have them. And again, I want to end with this. Don't go by what is, go by what can be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Uh, my name is Fidel Rodriguez, and I am a human relations consultant and racialized gang violence prevention specialist for the County of Los Angeles Commission on Human Relations. Um, <clears throat> I am also one that has been mentored by Luis Rodriguez and many other elders that are in this room today. I want to thank uh, Councilman Tony Cardenas as well as your staff for organizing this meeting and this gathering and Congressman Robert Bobby Scott for initiating a very dignified bill that we do not see too many times in the confines of the United States. So thank you for that. Um, with that being said, I would like to start off with a quote from Michael Mead, another one of our mentors. And I say that because within the Youth Promise Act, the word mentoring is in there. And without mentors, we are not able to see a future. And so with that being said, in troubled times, youth are doubly threatened since it is through trouble that they find their way. It may take a whole village to raise a child, but it takes the trouble of youth to raise a whole village, end quote, Michael Mead. Um, the one thing that they haven't told us, but we all know, is that our village needs to be repaired. It needs to be rebuilt. And by doing that, um, we have to analyze the situation. We have to understand the problem, the reaction, and the solution to that, that issue. And one of the things that I've been able to do uh, in my life, and especially over the past 15 years working in Los Angeles with uh, young so-called gang members and high-risk youth, is uh, develop, develop my own creativity. The creativity to create a program that may be called a gang intervention or prevention program, but it's really just developing human relations. Human relations with human beings that have been disenfranchised and dehumanized by the system. Um, being mentored, you know, I say I created this, this, these programs, but really they have been influenced by people like Luis, Michael Mead, Sifu Earl White, Michael De La Rocha, Father Greg Boyle, Alex Sanchez, Bo Taylor, Rest in Peace, Blinky Rodriguez, countless others that have been walked and walked in my life, and most importantly, my mother. And I have to say that because when we're talking about rebuilding our community, this is Fidel here, but this is not Fidel for the past. It took a whole village to help put me here, you know? It took a whole village to help raise the dignity in an in, in a, in a era where I hated myself for being Mexican, you know? Um, out of this development came a program called Spreading Seeds, Mind, Body, Spirit, a three-month rites of passage training that cultivates and activates and nurtures the innate abilities and gifts of young women and men in so-called gangs. The intention of this program is for participants to experience the beginning stages of a paradigm shift in consciousness 
in which they begin to think in the realm of alternative possibilities in their daily lives. New approaches to dealing with their anger, which many times ends up in violence. And as many people have said, violence is the language of the inarticulate. When we cannot articulate our problems, we turn to violence. By being immersed with positive mentoring and job opportunities and rites of passage programming and training, participants of this program spreading seeds begin to develop a new consciousness that enables them to make better choices and decisions that many times uh, become a matter of life and death. Utilizing a holistic approach to education, gang intervention, and racialized gang violence, spreading seeds works on the deconstruction and rebuilding of the mind, the body, and the spirit of participants through disciplined approaches such as martial arts, yoga, meditation, classes in poetry, American and world history, so, they, so, so young people and adults can understand their, their place in history. Malcolm X once said, of all of our studies, history is best qualified to reward our research. We have to think about that. How does history play into where we're at today? Um, there's also a part within this that is the culmination of the program. And that is a journey that we all take. This is a journey that we take to the Grand Canyon. We went to the Sedona, Arizona. And this May, May we'll be traveling to the Black Hills of South Dakota. Ultimately, the goal for participants is to acquire life skills, knowledge of themselves and their history that will enable them to begin to have a better understanding and belief in themselves, to be resilient despite negative choices made, and to be able to make new and different choices despite chaos, violence, and poverty. Spreading seeds ultimately is a journey into the meaning of the Greek aphorism, know thyself, known in Latin as nosheti ipsum. Know thyself has been known to refer to the ideal of understanding human behavior, morals, and thought. Because ultimately, to understand oneself is to understand other humans as well. If we do not know who we are, we self-destruct. I am a walking testament of that. Many of the young people and adults that are in this room are a walking testament of that. We self-destruct. We, we filter into drug addiction, alcoholism, etc. This is an active collaboration spreading seeds between the County of Los Angeles Commission on Human Relations, nonprofit organizations such as Homeboy Industries and the Christmas Project, teachers, medical doctors, community organizers, musicians, philanthropists, families, and most importantly, the young and men and women who are struggling in Los Angeles. As I close, I stand here on the shoulders of my ancestors as I think about my father who is in the streets of Tijuana, Mexico right now battling his drug addiction. And I think of how I've been able to escape his example as well as my own criminal-minded past actions and addictions. You know what it's been? It's been my family. It's been the mentors in my life. It's been the elders and the youth and adults from so-called gangs that have nurtured my character and essentially enabled me to know thyself. I leave you with this quote from the great humanitarian physician Albert Schwitzner, who once said, example is not the main thing in influencing others. It is the only thing. Thank you. I would like to pass the mic over to Arlene Ayala. I Eileen, um, I apologize. Yes, you can speak, but you're going to have to be brief because, again, we're now down to 30 minutes before we have to vacate the room. We have about uh, 20 uh, comment cards and a few more presenters. Go ahead. Yeah, my name is Robert Juarez. I just, I just want to uh, thank Fidel for this class that he um, he's teaching us a lot of things that most of us really need. And, you know, we've been through a lot of harsh things, and like he said, you know, the self-awareness of knowing who we are, questioning where we came from, that's what, really, that's what really frees us from this lifestyle that we've been imprisoned by. You know, and, and all these programs, the, the martial arts and all this, mind, body, and soul, we all need that. We need to have the whole package in order to really free ourselves and be at peace and, and be as one with everyone. And that's all I got to say. I just want to thank as well um, God and Fidel and Father Greg for the program and um, just for showing me love. I think everybody needs love, you know, and that's the most important thing. 
Uh, when kids don't have love, they go look for it somewhere else and, you know, just for everything he's done. And I just thank God again for this program. If not, I'll be back to, you know, the same old cycle, doing what I used to do. So just thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have uh, uh, the University of California, Los Angeles School of Public Affairs, uh, Miriam Krinsky. Uh, also, Georgia Leap and Laura Abrams. While they're coming up, I also want to let everybody know that at one time in this room, I want to thank the community for being here and showing support for the congressman's uh, bill. And uh, at one time, we had approximately 180 people attending in this hearing. Uh, so I want to thank the community for coming out and being that voice and being that presence. Come on up here. Thank you. In whatever order you're ready to begin, please. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for uh, allowing us to speak on behalf of the UCLA School of Public Affairs, which includes the Departments of Social Welfare, Public Policy, and Urban Planning. My name is Laura Abrams, and I'm a professor in the Department of Social Welfare. As representative faculty, we are highly concerned with the state and of children and youth in Southern California and the nation. Many of us are seasoned practitioners, researchers, and advocates, and we have seen over the years many well-intentioned prevention and intervention programs for youth at risk that for a variety of reasons have not been sustained. Some of this is due to lack of funding, some to shifts in political tides, and all too often, programs have received little support to partner with research institutions who are interested in their work and who can demonstrate its effects. At times, successful programs and new innovations in youth services aren't replicated as a result of a lack of accumulated knowledge. As a public institution, it's our mission to offer research, teaching, and training that makes a positive impact in the lives of young people, families, and communities. The Youth Promise Act speaks to many of these efforts, and we applaud the emphasis on research that is included in the act. At the same time, we also know that we want to know and figure out what works here and why in Los Angeles. We want to support, through our research efforts, many of the great programs that already exist here that do not have their own funding to conduct evaluation research. We are, uh, we are already doing work in this area. Some of the projects that we're engaged in on reentry, on gang intervention, on studying programs are working towards this effort but we also could use the further support in increasing these partnerships. Several of our faculty are supporting community-based organizations and also developing their own strategies to enhance uh, and examine their own impact, and we support that effort as well. Um, some of my colleagues, Dr. Georgia Leap and Miriam Krinsky, are going to offer their insights as well. Thank you. Good evening, and I am honored and thrilled to be here representing UCLA and talking to, to everyone in the room. We all know how hungry people are for help in this arena, and there needs to be a true partnership between the university, between the community, and between policymakers like yourselves. Now, we are here preaching to the choir. Councilmember Cardenas, you have been on the front lines. That blue pamphlet that we all have in our hands that you put together shows the hunger for help with outcome measures and out evaluation. Congressman Scott, the Youth Promise Act, just as my colleague Dr. Abrams said, has real meat in it in terms of what we need with research and evaluation. We are here as part of the university system, but you need to understand 
we are part of a new university that does not stay in the ivory tower, that works with our community-based organizations and our policymakers in partnership. And there's one more thing I want to tell you. Everyone in this room, these gang intervention workers, the folk from Homeboy, the people in the streets, they educate us. They are part of our learning. They are part of our students' learning. We need increased partnerships in terms of research and evaluation and training. And what we learn here is used to teach our students and to make them involved and engaged in this. There are many youth at risk. There are some in this room and there are some at our university. And we all need to be working together to educate and to make sure that this problem will end. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Miriam Krinsky, and it's my pleasure to be joining in UCLA's chorus and also joining the tremendously committed professionals who have been addressing you here today. Uh, depending how our basketball team is doing, it may be my particular pleasure to be here rather than in Westwood. Uh, it's my aim to supplement the remarks of my colleagues by offering the perspectives of someone who has seen two bookends of that path, Congressman Scott, that you referred to, that path toward the cliff. I've seen both the starting point of the thousands of abused and neglected children who are part of our foster care system, who too often face a childhood of upheaval, of trauma, and of instability. And I've also seen the ending point of somebody who spent time as a federal prosecutor. In those 15 years as a federal prosecutor, I saw firsthand the byproduct of our failure to attend early to the needs of youth who are at risk. I saw countless federal offenders, many of whom were barely older than 18, who had a past history of time in our juvenile justice system, and before that, of having been abused and neglected. I saw the cost to our society and the human toll of a loss of that human potential when we gave up on notions of rehabilitation and presumed too often that our public safety was furthered simply by longer and harsher penalties. And I've also spent 10 years as an advocate in the foster care system, seeing too many opportunities missed, too much siloed governance, and inadequate resources to attend to the needs of children who are suffering from abuse and neglect. There are today in Los Angeles over 25,000 children in foster care. Now the good news is it used to be double that figure, but the bad news is that's still the largest population of any locality in the nation and exceeds the foster care population of many states. Those youth too often face a life moving from placement to placement, disruption of schooling, inadequate health and mental health care, and the severing of ties with any emotional anchor that could keep them from falling into a life of gang affiliation. As a result, foster care too often is the first step down a path to our juvenile justice system, which too often is a step down that precipice, that cliff, into our federal justice system. Studies confirm that youth who have been abused and neglected are at substantially higher risk of ending up in juvenile justice, often as a result of simply placement crimes acting out in group homes, adolescent misbehavior that's addressed differently than it would be if children were in a family setting. So if we understand these struggles, I think we have to bear in mind that as we look to strategies akin to the Youth Promise Act, we need to look and scroll back early and address the tremendous needs of our abused and neglected children in foster care. We need to strengthen the public will to support the exact types of early and proactive interventions, Congressman Scott, that you have championed for so long. We know that youth need a safe and supported place to spend their time, that youth need positive role models and mentors, that they need a high school degree and they need job skills. And we also know that these youth will often come to the attention of law enforcement early. There are over 400,000 arrests every year as a result of youth running away, curfew violations, loitering, or liquor law offenses. 
These numbers show us that we can identify youth for whom early interventions would be effective, and we can help them before it's too late. Finally, we need to improve the image of our young people and strengthen our public's resolve to rally around them. We need to encourage our media to more responsibly cover the achievements of our youth to the same degree they cover the sensational crime of the moment. And we need to involve the voices of youth, such as the voices that we've heard today, in carrying those public messages forward. So we can and we must move forward, and we must do so with due recognition of the passage of time in a children's life and in a child's clock. I thank you, both of you, for your leadership in this area and look forward to seeing further advancements with your leadership. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Now, um, we'll bring forward someone from the Human Rights Watch, Carol Sh Ch Chadra, Director of U.S. Programs. And also, while she's preparing to speak, I'd also like to, for everybody to acknowledge that um, Chief Bratton has been and continues to be very committed to making sure that prevention and intervention are part of the solutions in this city. And I just wanted to thank uh, Commander Gannon for being with us today. Thank you so much, Commander, for, for your time and your efforts. And uh, one of the things that uh, I know as, as a young boy growing up in Pacoima, I never uh, believed in my ignorance, I never believed that a police officers or police departments or police chiefs or commanders would actually sit and listen and learn from individuals in the community. And one thing I'd like to say is, and that's why uh, Commander Gannon is here, uh, to listen and to learn and to respect uh, all of us who are here speaking today. So once again, I want to thank you for your participation. Appreciate it. Go ahead. Thank you. Councilmember Cardenas and Representative Scott, thank you very much for today. Councilmember, um, on behalf of Human Rights Watch, as well as being co-chair of the National Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Coalition, I want to thank you for holding this hearing and also for introducing the resolution in support of the Youth Promise Act. And Congressman Scott, thank you for introducing what is the most promising federal legislation on behalf of our young people. Before I moved to Washington, I was a high school teacher in California at a school for youth in the juvenile justice system, and the large majority of my students were gang involved. And after that, I was a state and then federal public defender where I represented young people in the California Youth Authority and then in federal facilities where, ironically, many of them joined gangs for protection, even if they weren't gang involved previously. And what my students and what my clients taught me is that the way we treat our children and the way we address the gang issue in this country is the most critical human rights issue that we face as a nation. For too many years, the approach towards youth gang violence in this country has been one of incarceration towards our most vulnerable youth and in, in the most challenged communities. This approach is deeply flawed. It's contributed to widening racial and ethnic disparities in the juvenile and criminal justice st systems. It's stunningly expensive, and it simply doesn't work. The good news is we do know it works, and the Youth Promise Act, which now in the new Congress is H.R. 1064 in the House and in the Senate S-435, is based on a growing body of evidence demonstrating that school and community-based programs and practices, mentoring, job training, intervention, prevention, can and does effectively reduce gang affiliation and crime and increase rates of high school graduation and productivity. The Youth Promise Act recognizes that federal dollars are best spent on prevention and intervention measures that lead young people away from gang activity and into positive programs and activities that give young people the support they need to learn and grow. And importantly, the Youth Promise Act rejects the one-size-fits-all approaches that funnel more youth, particularly poor youth and youth of color, into the juvenile and criminal justice systems. And I'm not talking in the abstract. Because unfortunately, the Youth Promise Act is not the only federal approach to gangs that we see in the Congress. There is countervailing legislation, and ironically, it has been introduced by members of Congress from California um, that takes a very different approach, an approach that Human Rights Watch and countless organizations strongly oppose. 
because the approach will do a number of things. We've heard from Kim McGill, Javier Storing, Elias Elisson, and others about the danger of life without parole penalties. The United States is the only country in the world where we impose the sentence, a sentence of, a sentence to die in prison upon youth. There are currently 2,502 individuals serving the sentence of life without parole in this country for conduct they committed under the age of 18. Not a single individual is serving that sentence anywhere else in the rest of the world. The countervailing gang approach called the Gang Abatement Act, and it was introduced in the Senate already in this Congress by Senator Feinstein. It's been introduced in the House uh, just last week by Congressman Schiff, will increase life without parole penalties for youth as well as for adults and not just for the most violent conduct. There are, there are provisions in that legislation that would impose life without parole penalties for attempted maiming. You can think of an overzealous prosecutor imposing or charging attempted maiming for heated conduct on the playground. Um, the sentence to die in prison for children is not the answer to the gang problem. The countervailing federal approach to gangs is also problematic because it will drastically increase the racial and ethnic disparity in the juvenile and criminal justice system through an overbroad gang definition through a host of other problems. It's telling that in the last Congress, eight members of Congress, um, six of whom were from the Congressional Black Caucus, withdrew from that legislation because um, it will increase racial and ethnic disparities. So, we are thrilled that we have a positive approach that does the right thing, and that is the Youth Promise Act. And what's unique about the Youth Promise Act, and Congressman Scott referred to this already, is that it brings together the community, the experts in this room who work day in and day out on the gang problem and know what works, together to assess the strengths and needs in the community and put together a proposal on um, bringing together all of the stakeholders. There are many people in this room who traditionally have been excluded from policy making and finding the solution. The Youth Promise Act brings together the experts who know what's needed. Um, it also recognizes that a one-size-fits-all approach won't work. The solution in Providence, Rhode Island might not be the same approach that will work in the City of Angels. One community might need more job training, one community might need more mentoring, one community might need more after school programs or anti-truancy programs. So the Youth Promise Act recognizes that and leaves it up to the local community to come up with a solution. We applaud the congressman and the legislation for that. I would like to note um, there is agreement, there's no dispute that actual violence does require effective enforcement, but we already have plenty of federal statutes in place to prosecute gang crime. And as a nation, we have spent far more resources arresting and prosecuting young people who aren't violent than we have trying to address and eliminate the actual causes of gang involvement and youth crime, a fence or an ambulance. Increased arrest and incarceration of youthful and nonviolent offenders is not the answer to the gang problem. Chief Bratton and many other law enforcement officers have repeatedly said, we can't arrest our way out of the gang problem. What we need are resources on the ground. We need support for those resources through, the youth, through legislation like the Youth Promise Act. The United States Department of Justice has also found that incarceration does little to disrupt the violent activities of gang-affiliated inmates. And in fact, prisons and detention centers can strengthen gang affiliations and become a breeding ground for potential gang activity. And so far as our young people in the community form gangs for protection and family-like relationships, incarcerated youth have an even greater need for protection. Um, Council member, you already recognized that the United States bears the dubious distinction of being the world's leading incarcerator with 2.3 million people behind bars. That's up 500% from just 30 years ago. We don't need more of the same failed policies. And a disturbingly disproportionate share of those incarcerated are young people, and specifically young men from Latino and African American high poverty neighborhoods. They bear the brunt of failed criminal justice and gang policies. We are in a crisis in this country. We have an incarceration crisis and an economic crisis. But as the economist Paul Romer put it, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. We have a unique opportunity right now to turn the corner by changing our approach and investing, investing wisely in the greatest resource we have in this country, our children and our young people. We can turn the corner. 
and by enacting the Youth Promise Act and make it in, in, into law, which we will, we will succeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next, we'll go to uh, public comment. And uh, we're going to give uh, everybody on public comment one minute to speak. I do apologize. I we normally give two minutes. But uh, due to the fact that we need to vacate the room, uh, we're going to bleed a little bit over that as it is. So I'm going to call you up one at a time. Also, I think it's very, very important. I mean this with all due respect to then Senator, State Senator Adam Schiff, now Congressman Adam Schiff. Uh, the Schiff Cardenas Act was two pieces of legislation. Adam Schiff was carrying in the Senate in California at the time the COPS program. And I was carrying the juvenile justice program. And we married the two uh, for reasons to have make sure that both of them survive, not just one. So the fact of the matter is, uh, and I have tremendous respect for Congressman Schiff, the fact of the matter is the writing of the juvenile justice portion of the Schiff Cardenas Act was written in the State Assembly by me then Assemblyman Tony Cardenas and Congressman, now Congressman Adam Schiff did not write the juvenile justice portion. His focus was on the COPS program. So uh, therefore, um, if it comes to it, um, just letting people know on the record, um, I will be speaking against uh, the Schiff uh, bill and also the Diane Feinstein bill at the appropriate time. Uh, Luis Garcia, and then please uh, uh, come up it's to the microphone and please stand forward. We first have Luis Garcia, and then Johnny Godinez. Uh, Johnny, please come up. Uh, I'll, I'll call the person up again if they don't come up when I call them the first time. Johnny, go ahead. Uh, good evening, Councilman uh, Cardenas uh, and uh, Congressman Bobby Scott. Uh, thank you for, for coming here, visiting in L.A. My name is Johnny Godinez. I'm a certified gang intervention specialist, a pro program coordinator for SEA Gang Intervention. Uh, I work out of the Boyle Heights, East LA area. Uh, I'm, I mean, all my colleagues said just about much everything. Um, and I, I'm just tired, you know, in, uh, of seeing our young people get killed. Uh, since November, I've been to five funerals. Um, this killing and violence got to stop. And I know for a fact that we are making a difference, our gang intervention specialists, prevention specialists, the practitioners, those that are out there in the field, in the trenches. If it weren't for us, it would be a lot way worse. So uh, just like Jeff Carr said, we need to continue that summer night lights, those kind of uh, activities for the members also. We have a league going that had to stop, but thank you anyways for being here. I'll see you tomorrow in our thank area. Thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, Sadeka Shabazz. Sadeka Shabazz filled out a card. And while Sadeka is coming up, can Michael Mata please get ready to speak? Hi, good evening. Um, I'll make it short. Um, thank you to the to the council member, oh, just the one council member left, and the congressman um, for having this tonight. I'm representing the Children's Defense Fund, California, and um, like the congressman mentioned before, um, we recently launched our Creditor Prison Pipeline campaign, which is a national and local um, effort to stop the funneling of tens of thousands of, of youth down life paths that lead to incarceration. Um, I want to just bring out a few points that I think are really important, and that's that um, a few of the speakers earlier mentioned it, that we have to nurture the whole child in a whole family, in a whole community. It's not just one piece that's failing our children. It's all these different systems that are conspiring against our children and our families to lead them down this life path. And it's not just the juvenile justice system that's broken. It's the systems that have been serving them have been broken before they ever get to the juvenile justice system. Inadequate education, inadequate access to health care and mental health care. Even before a child is born, they're set up for failure if their mother is not getting uh, prenatal care. Um, so, like I said, just wanted to reiterate those two points, that it's the whole child and the whole family and the whole community, and that we have to be nurturing these children even before they're born with taking care of their moms with health care and the likes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Michael Mata. 
And then we'll have Alex Sanchez. Thank you, Councilman Cadernas, and welcome to Los Angeles. Congressman Scott, I'm with World Vision. Um, we are in 100 countries around the world, and currently in the United States in 11 uh, urban and rural areas, serving over 600,000 children and youth. I want to support and echo much, much of the comments that have been made, um, in particular supporting the aspects of the, the bill that supports and encourages evidence-based practices in, in, in response to or reaction to just suppression strategies. Um, that is a much more comprehensive and integrative uh, strategy of encouraging and bringing back um, the agencies and organizations that are owned by the community. And um, above all, we want to encourage, and we already heard it, the role of youth themselves in their own development. We believe that they have a, a, a say, they have wisdom and a perspective that will support um, the changing of their communities. Unfortunately, our youth went back to get home and do their homework, but we have a group here from um, MacArthur Park who are going to respond and bring findings and recommendations to youth councilmen on how we can make this change real. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Alex Sanchez. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Cardenas and Congressman Bobby Scott. Um, I work for an agency called Homies for Needles that started in Salvador in '96, uh, and then we started here. Our our main focus is family unification. We need to, in regards to the reentry of these individuals that are coming out, we need to get them back in their homes to be fathers and mothers of those children. Um, current policies, such as Community Shield, on a federal level, has has uh, deported under us, uh, Congressman Serrano's latest report that came out February 13, over 100,000 parents from their children, leaving over 100,000 children uh, fatherless or motherless. That means 100,000 children will be coming through all our gang intervention offices seeking refuge because they didn't have that mentor and that role model that is their first, their father or mother. We ask that you support also the Citizen Child Protection Act that is by Congressman Serrano, and I like, would like to give you some info on it, both. Thank you, the sergeants will take it. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Luis Enrique Guzman. Good afternoon. I'm here to represent Homies Unidos, and I'm here to, to plead for you guys to support the child, the Citizen Child uh, Protection Act that is leaving hundreds of kids in the streets and they're going to end up in gangs. So I'm pleading for you, Mr. Bobby, to support this act that is already in the House of Representatives and give this child the opportunity to go to his schools and be somebody in front of the society. Thank you, gentlemen. Gracias. Thank you. Daryl Maxian. Thank you. I'm also representing Homeo Unidos. The Youth Promise Act, I think, is very good. I, I wish that I had it when I was a youth, but I didn't. I went to the juvenile system, ended up bad. Three days ago, I got out of prison with no family to, uh, to lean on. And yesterday when I go to the parole officer, ask him for help, because I have nothing, he tells me that we're in a crisis. So I, I think if we pass this bill, it'll be a, a strong leap in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you very much. And welcome back. Kenny Green. Don't fall asleep on me, Kenny. <laughs> How you doing, Councilman? Uh, basically, I just want to respond to, a bit, um, you know, the Promise Youth Act. Um, just listening to the public defender, uh, Michael Judge, saying that, you know, we don't invest in our youth, but we basically spend on it. That's, that's so, so very true because as an intervention worker, I go on a lot of, uh, I see a lot of youth, you know, that are laying in the streets dead or, or in the hospital trying to fight for their life or, getting incarcerated, and it's so true what he said. We do spend instead of investing our youth. And when I looked at this bill, it was like, you know, something that we should be doing is investing in our youth. 
And like Janice Hahn always says, you know, we got to spin on the front end of, the, of our kids instead of the back end. So, you know, I'm just speaking in support of this bill. And um, I know I could have spoke on, but one minute. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. T. Rogers. T. Rogers. Saul Annenberg. Thank you, Councilman Cardenas, and thank you, uh, Congressman Scott, uh, Congressman Bobby Scott. I thank uh, Commander Gannon for coming, and I want to just briefly give a quotation from our great Chief of Police, Will William Bratton. He says here, as I wrote nearly a decade ago, there are not many optimists in this country. I am an optimist. An organization is always reflective of its leader. And if there is no belief at the top echelons, there will be none below. I fully believe that with able police leadership, political will, well-trained cops, and community participation, and may I add, with the Youth Promise Act, thanks to Congressman, we can take back America. We can take it back state by state, city by city, borough by borough, block by block, and we will win. I believed that then, and I believe it now. The unfolding success is lo of Los Angeles is confirming it once again. Si se puede, yes we can. Thank you. Gracias. Michelle White. Michelle White. Good evening. I'm uh, Michelle White with the Pasadena uh, ACLU chapter. Uh, we have met with and will continue to meet with Senator Schiff, uh, Representative Schiff, around our ask, our plea for him to withdraw his act in favor of supporting uh, the Youth Act. So uh, we call upon everyone in this room to do the same, especially those who are in his uh, district. Secondly, I'd like to say that we thank the uh, council for having these uh, hearings because it helps those jurisdictions outside of LA. You're the 800 pound gorilla, you set the, uh, the, the way for the rest of us, and if you can do something like this, then Pasadena hopefully will do the same. We recently had a uh, mixed uh, action with uh, the Pasadena Unified uh, School District where we were asking that they not extend armed police presence into middle schools. They did that, but at the same time, they said that they would give them more civil rights. So. We're, it's a long struggle. We will continue working. Thank you. Thank you. Malik Spellman. Malik Spellman. Cassandra Gonzalez. And while Cassandra's coming up, can Gina Cifuentes get ready to speak? Hi, I might need more than a minute, maybe a minute, 30 seconds. Um, my name is Cassandra. I'm a formerly incarcerated youth, former gay member. Um, I grew up in foster care, juvenile hall placement, um, Dorothy Kirby Center, you name it, I, I've been in it. It was people like um, Javier Story and my mentor, Laura, that really made an impact in my life. And later on, um, a poetry workshop like Dream Yard Los Angeles that was really influential in my life and the change that it brought about that I could go to college and I could actually um, be somebody. I became a trained organizer for the Youth Justice Coalition where um, I'm actively involved in giving back and um, I just want to let you know that I'm a success story and that people like me can make it. And once somebody actually uh, put in a belief in me that you know actually saw potential when I was 12 years old sitting in the chaplain at Central Juvenile Hall. It was then that I, I got to identify myself as someone who could make it, and here I am today. And who's the, who's the little person with you? Savannah, my five-year-old. I have another one, 18 months at, um, at home, but being a mom and coming from where I came from, I never thought I'd be here today doing what I'm doing. Thank you, Cassandra. Gina Cifuentes, Gina, Clarissa Wu. Hi, 
Good evening. My name is Clarice Wu, and I'm the policy manager with the ACLU of Southern California. The American Civil Liberties Union works daily in the courts, legislatures, and communities to defend the rights and liberties that the Constitution and laws of the United States guarantee every person in this country. Um, we know that the Constitution is meant to safeguard against government abuses of power, but all too often these abuses of power um, and rights of those involved in the criminal justice system are ignored and often compromised. We know that the youth, mostly coming from low income and communities of color, are especially vulnerable. The Youth Promise Act is designed smartly to help reduce juvenile crime by encouraging early intervention and mentoring, and the ACLU commends the LA City Council for addressing this issue and thanks Council Members Cardenas and Parks for authoring this very important resolution. Um, thank you. Um, I know my time is running out, but we stand together to work together to pass this legislation and with the communities involved because with the community's involvement, we will be empowered to be part of this fix. Thank you very much. Thank you. Maria Tavares. Maria Tavares. Good evening. My name is Maria Tavares. I'm a mother of an incarcerated youth. He was put through the adult system and was sentenced to eight years. My, my son was not a gang member, but going through the system, I've gotten to know a lot of gang members and a lot of parents. And basically, I want to tell you that maybe for the kids that I have seen through the system that have gotten 50 to life or 25 to life, um, one kid comes into mind, um, David. He got three life sentences, 25 to life sentences. And I see this skinny kid come out at visiting when I visit my son with a tattoo on his neck. And I just want you to let you know that he's also God's child, whether he's a God, um, gang member or not, and that we need to treat all of our kids as children, which is what they are. And I, I'm happy that this um, Youth Promise Act is coming out because then that will keep a lot of pain and a lot of kids away from the adult system. So thank you, and hopefully this is a stepping stone to make more um, changes for our youth and um, for Prop 21 to change these laws. Thank you. Thank you. Ra Rachel Vidiman, I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, good evening. Yes, my name is Rachel Veerman, and thank you, Councilman and Congressman, for being here today and for having this. Um, I am also the mother of an incarcerated youth. My son is going to be 21 uh, next month. He's been incarcerated since he was 17. And as Maria Tavares, I know her. She's a wonderful mom. Um, I was very fortunate that my son stayed in the youth court, and uh, but he was facing 28 years to life. And what I like about this act is that you are going to see children as individuals. Um, the system that we're in now, the first day we entered the core, I thought, okay, we're going to sit down and we're going to discuss, because he was a child, what happened, how did we get to this point, what can be done, and how can we resolve this in a humane manner. And what I found in our system was heartbreaking. Um, he was not seen as an individual. He was not seen as a person. I was not seen as a person either. Um, all I was getting was, your son is a horrible person. He's, gonna, he's never going to see the light of day. Um, the district attorneys didn't want anything to do with listening to our side. All that they were listening to is that they thought that he had done something horrible and he was going to stay in prison. And thank you for believing in my son because my son is a beautiful boy. And being through this system, I have made it a point to meet all the children that I go every Sunday, Saturday and Sunday. I visit, I, I'm fortunate to visit my son and I have gotten to meet many of the other youth that are there. And they are also beautiful young men and women and they do deserve a second chance. Like Javier Starring said, they may have committed a horrible act, but they are not horrible people. They're beautiful people and hopefully our, the system will change where we're, our kids are not viewed as 
They're viewed as humans and not as just an object, a throwaway object that, the, that should never see the light of day. So thank you so much for presenting this act, and I hope that it will bring change. We need change. The system not only breaks, breaks my son, it broke my family. It breaks every, all our friends around. It affects everybody around. It just breaks the whole community, and it, we need to build it again. So thank you. Thank you. That concludes the public comment cards that I've received for this committee. And um, I'd also take this opportunity, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all the staff that are here. Um, we're almost done. Uh, thank you for all your overtime and all your work. And uh, also I'd like to give a special thank you to Michael De La Rocha with my office, who spent many hours. And also Eduardo Hewitt from my office. and. All the other staff who've been uh, working with us to make this a uh, successful uh, day and also a successful committee hearing. And uh, with that, I'd like to uh, give the Congressman an opportunity to make some closing remarks. Well, thank you, um, Councilmember um, Car Car Cardenas. It's certainly a pleasure to work with you on this, on this bill, and certainly a pleasure to work with all of the people that came out tonight to testify. That just uh, reinforces our uh, charge that we have to work as hard as we can to get the bill passed. I'd ask for everybody that testified and everybody supporting the bill to call your local uh, congressman and if you belong to uh, statewide or national organizations to get your national organizations to do the same across the nation. Uh, I believe that the um, Youth Promise Act can pass if everybody does everything we know how to do. Uh, we can get it passed. It uh, makes sense. It'll save more money than it costs and it will give our young people better opportunities than they have today. Uh, so, uh, Councilmember Cardenas, it's certainly a pleasure, to w again, to work with you, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Congressman. You know, we appreciate all the efforts of your many, many years of legislative experience and your leadership as well. Uh, but also, I'd like you to please clarify, uh, we are still speaking on the record, can you please clarify, does the Youth Promise Act, if if and when it passes and it's funded, does it take any money away from uh, law enforcement? Does it take any money away from uh, other programs? No, actually it has uh, some support for law enforcement under the um, youth-oriented policing um, or YOPS program, but it doesn't do anything to law enforcement. The expectation is it will be still for those that are committing crimes uh, solving the crimes, prosecuting, and locking them up at the rate we're doing today, which in some communities is at a rate of over 4,000 per 100,000, uh, about um, 20 times worse than the incarceration rates um, found, about 40 times worse than the average incarceration rate found around the world. Most com com countries lock up about 50 to 200. United States is over 700 and some minority communities as high as 4,000 per 100,000. That will go on so long as the crimes are committed. Uh, our view is that if you make a little investment up front, fewer crimes will be committed so that the police will have less work to do. Thank you. And, and uh, <laughs> earlier today, I was inspired to uh, tell the public and the congressman that I think that this bill is genius. It's actually simplistic genius. It actually is so obvious and so simple uh, that I hope that uh, your colleagues in, in Congress and also the President will support your legislation and make sure that it becomes law and that it becomes uh, what it should be, and that is to be given the opportunity to prove that what we've been doing have many what we've been doing has many, many components that do not need to continue and also to the taxpayers, if anything, to the taxpayers, for us to save billions and to have safer communities, this is the legislation that will do that. This is genius, and I want to thank you again for your leadership. And we, uh, those of us who understand this, those of us who support this, we need to make sure that we do not over uh, underestimate the need for each and every one of us to get letters of support, to respectfully speak to our congressional leaders, and to write to the President 
and to make sure that every organization that has a title understands that they need to weigh in and support this legislation. It is our job to do that. The congressman cannot be everywhere. He cannot be in every state. He cannot get every organization to hear what he has to say. It's up to all of us to make sure that that message gets out and that the correspondence goes back to Washington in support of this legislation. So with that, we've already taken a vote on this item and it has passed. And we, uh, we will close on item number two. I want to thank all of you for coming. Um, this is an official committee hearing, so with that, we'll open it up for general public comment. All of the comment cards were uh, on item number two for today's hearing, and I do not see any general public comment cards. General public comment is open. It is now closed. And with that, this committee is now adjourned. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you.